All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to the DXC house and to our community space. Um, my name is Priya Sahani, and I'm an organizer with Direct Action Everywhere. Um, and today we're going to be talking about animal rights and racism. And um, actually, I want to say something. For those of you who haven't signed in on the sign-in sheet before you leave, please make sure to do that, just so we have your contact information and everything. Um, and this is Wayne Shung, for those of you who don't know him. And um, Wayne is going to be leading the, um, uh, doing a presentation. And we're going to be stopping and having a small discussion. Then we'll have a larger discussion after the presentation. Thanks, Priya. Thanks to everyone for showing up today. Uh, I know this is sort of a, a charged subject. There's a lot of debate and discussion on it, um, and a lot of theory and a lot of academic papers that have been written on this subject. But for me, I'm coming to the issue of animal rights and racism from a very personal place, um, because one of the reasons I am an animal rights activist today is because of my experiences of, of feeling ostracized and excluded and even physically assaulted when I was growing up as an immigrant kid in Indiana. And I remember the first time I went to school um, and I looked at all these white faces because the community I was growing up in was you know, roughly 98, 99% white. Um, and it was just kind of opening up to immigrants like myself. Yeah, I just didn't see anyone who looked like myself and I didn't see hear anyone who spoke my language. And it, the first day I went to school, um, all these kids were kind of already doing the Chinese, Japanese eye thing. And there's this little limerick that everyone would do. There was something about like, um, you know, Chinese, Japanese, something about knees, your knees. I don't even remember the limerick. But I just remember, even as like a six-year-old kid, thinking to myself, oh, clearly there's some difference here. And it's a difference that's permitting and allowing and encouraging everyone. And, and not any of these individuals. I mean, these are six-year-old kids, so they haven't actively thought about racism yet. They've just identified some obvious difference They've recognized the fact that they're not able to communicate with me the way they can communicate with all their friends in school and, and allow them to do some pretty mean things. And, and relative to what happens to animals and what happens to a lot of minorities all over the world, this is a fairly trivial experience. But at the same time, I think it, it definitely started to condition me. And I had so much more difficult experiences later on that I might share. I might not. Um, but with, with, without further ado, let's just jump into the talk. The, the subject of today's talk, as you all know, is the color of movement, animal rights and racism. And the plan of the talk today is we're going to go through three points. The first is that speciesism and racism have incredibly important parallels. And because of those parallels, there's a lot of alliances that I think can be built between anti-racist movements and activists and our anti-speciesist animal rights movement. Notwithstanding the fact that there are these potential alliances and ideological similarities and psychological similarities between the struggles against speciesism and racism, the color of our movement is still unfortunately almost entirely white. So the best, most recent statistics we have <coughs> suggest that less than 3% of all animal rights activists are people of color. Um, and as we'll see, relative to the portion of our population, and in California especially, which is now majority minority, um, that's a pretty low percentage that I think we can, we can definitely do something to improve. And then finally, we'll note that notwithstanding the fact that there are these ideological, political, cultural alliances that can be built, notwithstanding the fact that we haven't done a very good job of including minorities, minorities tend to be targeted um, disproportionately to their contribution to animal abuse. And we'll talk a little bit about these campaigns in the course of the talk. So that's the plan of the talk. I also want to say just thematically, all of the direct action of our presentations at this house are intended to be dynamic discussions. So if you have any questions, if you have criticisms, thoughts, stories you want to share, we'll have a designated space at two points during the talk where we'll invite specific contributions from, from the audience. At, on, on two particular subjects, but at the end of the talk we always have a discussion too. But, having said that, if there's something you see that you'd like to chime in on, by all means, feel free to. Okay, so let's go to the first slide. So the first thing to note is that the parallels between anti-racism and anti-speciesism are, uh, are not particularly subtle. <laughs> because denigration of racial minorities has always involved this animalistic element. Um, not so long ago, as all of you know, racial minorities were treated as second-class citizens. And one of the ways that powerful forces and powerful voices used to denigrate minorities was to compare them to animals. And you can see, this is a quote from Harry Truman in, in the context of World War II in the 1940s when we interned Japanese people in camps, concentration camps, not unlike what was happening in Germany. And the way he justified some of these practices and the way he justified um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki was to say, 
that the only language the Japanese seem to understand is the one we've been using to bombard them. When you have to deal with a beast, you have to treat him like a beast. The idea here is not only that Japanese are more like animals than human beings, but because they are more like animals, we're permitted to engage in not just violence, but atrocities against them. I mean, two entire cities were obliterated in nuclear holocaust during the World War II. And Harry, Harry Truman, the president of the entire uni United States, was publicly announcing that the reasoning behind this was because they're, quote, mere beasts. So this also extended to oppression of racial minorities within the United States. So this is a sign in Texas, and in Texas, you know, there's obviously a not insignificant Mexican population. There's also a not even significant Negro population, what was then called Negroes in the South. And as you can see, there are, there are signs in establishments all over Texas that would say things like this. No dogs, no Negroes, no Mexicans. The idea being that dogs, Negroes, and Mexicans are similar categories, and they similarly should be excluded from certain spaces where we, we don't like them being around. Is this ancient history? You might be saying to me now, well, you know, in the 50s and 60s, of course, there were terrible things that have happened and terrible things that, that people said, but we now live in a post-civil rights world, correct? Well, let's look at some recent ones. Um, you all have heard about the Tea Party, and you all know probably that the Tea Party, which is a conservative, a reactionary conservative movement in the United States, was very anti-immigrant and made anti-immigration a huge part of their philosophical agenda. Um, and Priya was actually the one who found this video at a Tea Party rally where a reporter uh, goes up to one of the participants in this demonstration and asks, why do you just like Mexicans? Why are you against immigration? And the man's angry response, and we're not going to show the video because it's pretty horrible, and I know there are Mexican people in this room, they might not want to hear this, but you know, he said basically that he considered Mexicans equivalent to animals, which again is not only racist, but it's also speciesist. The idea being we can exclude them, deport them, engage in violence against them because they're similar to animals. The question, of course, we're all asking is, even if they were animals, and in fact we are biological animals, why would that justify violence? Mm -hmm. Of course, this is just a tea party. It's only just one kind of random person who's drawn from a demonstration. Is this reflective of a broader cultural Well, this is from 2010. Um, this cartoon is not. This cartoon is from the early 20th century. It's a political cartoon showing how in the early 20th century, the 19th century, there was a lot of anti-Chinese animus. But the quote at the top is not. It's from a very famous singer whose identity I'm not going to disclose at this point, because I'm going to talk about him a little bit later. But he's actually a singer I personally admire, um, for reasons that will be obvious a little later in this discussion. But there's a quote from um, a public discussion that this, and it was a reported discussion, so it, was, it seems pretty clear that he actually wrote this down, that you can't help but feel that Chinese are a subspecies. So the strange thing again is, suppose that Chinese are a subspecies or a different species, why would that justify treating them differently insulting them or denigrating them just because they're a different species. Um, and if you want an academic discussion of this, there was a Stanford study that was performed just a few years ago by a very prominent psychologist at Stanford called Not Yet Human, Implicit Knowledge, Historical Dehumanization, and Contemporary Consequences. Um, Jennifer L. Eberhardt at Stanford University examined why racial prejudice existed and found explicitly in the case of African Americans that one of the reasons this prejudice exists is because of dehumanization, because whites think of non-whites in many ways as, as if they were animals. Um, the specific metaphor that was examined in this study was the ape African-American metaphor, the comparison between African-Americans and apes. And what this study found was even people who claim they're not racist have important implicit associations, these subconscious processes, where they think of people who are non-white as mere animals. And one of the interesting implications of this study, and one of the interesting findings of this study, is that this also leads them to increase the endorsement against viol violence against those same racial minorities. So there's a two-step process. One, they associate with them with an animal. <coughs> and secondly, they, they, they become more encouraged and permitted um, to, to allow violence. So when they see police, for example, beating African Americans, beating Mexicans, or even beating other people of color, their reactions just aren't as strong. Um, and this was in 2008, so it's obviously very recent research. Okay, so. Let's look a little more theoretically at the, the steps that are, that are happening. And if you look at the literature, racism and I will argue speciesism go through ba basically exactly the same three-step process. First, there's the identification of the other. There's this, this attribution of some distinction that's somewhat arbitrary. In fact, I would say argue entirely arbitrary. And it's, it becomes cognitively, psychologically, culturally, and politically salient and important. Um, and there's a lot of evidence, including studies of just looking at resumes of people's names, where if someone identifies some obvious distinction, whether it's physical, linguistic, 
or even just someone's name, they immediately emphasize on that attribute and stereotype. I mean, we've all heard of stereotyping. This is what happens when people stereotype. They see a woman, they see uh, a, a Chinese person, they see a black person, or they see an immigrant, and they immediately associate all these characteristics with them that might actually be true to that particular individual. Um, the second step is the suppression of empathy because of that distinction. You were different from me, so I'm not going to feel the same way I feel towards a white person as I feel towards you. And there's actually really provocative, interesting studies performed at the University of Milan showing that when white people watch the pain of non-white people, the pain matrix, the electrical pain matrix in their brain, the sweat on their skin and the cortisone level released in their blood is much lower than when they watch a white person. So there's actually a neurological response you can measure that's different and significantly different. When a white person watches a white person suffering, they become agitated, they start to sweat. The pain matrix is activated, their mirror neurons fire. But when they see a non-white person, they tend to think, oh, you know, not that big of a deal. Um, and the same is true, obviously, of animals. So there's a suppression of empathy. And the third and final step that leads to active violence is triggering animosity. And there's a very famous study done at NYU showing that when you see a face that's different from your own, the amygdala, which is the part of your brain that triggers the fight or flight response, right? I need to fight or I need to run, I'm, I'm afraid. It's activated and, and becomes electrically agitated when they see a non-white face, when white people see a non-white face. And one of the most interesting implications of that research is oftentimes even people who are not white will have that same neurological response to non-white faces. Um, and even in your own racial category sometimes, which shows you how deeply embedded. And, and one thing that's really important to point out is in all these studies, you know, they show the response is very disproportionate to the actual threat being posed. So this is an unrealistic, emotional, irrational response to someone just because they're different. Um, and so what we're going to try and argue in this presentation, what I think is true, is that these exact three same steps occur when we see non-human animals. That you identify the other, you suppress your empathy, and then you agitate and trigger active animosity. Or alternatively, when you see animosity directed against an individual by another person, because your empathy is suppressed, your concern is also repressed. Okay, so Priya is going to move on to here. Um, we're going to just share some personal stories of racism and, and compare them to stories of speciesism. I'll just start out very briefly by telling you my story. Um, I grew up an immigrant. Um, I was born in this country, but I traveled back and forth between Taiwan and the United States very regularly. And all my family and the few friends that my family had in the United States were all Chinese Americans, um, or, or just Chinese people. Actually, most of them were not even Americans at that point. They were just immigrants. Um, and as I said, from the first time I set foot in the school, I obviously saw that there were some differences. And because the school I grew up in was entirely white, it was anomaly. It was a strange thing to see this immigrant kid who spoke Chinese first and foremost. I didn't know English. I didn't know it very well. And over the course of the next six or seven years, I had some pretty difficult and traumatic and even violent um, experiences in school. Um, partly, partly because of explicit racism, but also because of subtle racism. So one example of this is the school authorities, the teachers, and the administration, when I would say subtle things about things that concern me in some small way, like the fact that you know, like I wasn't being um, encouraged or allowed to in, in, in engage in pursuits that Chinese typically weren't stereotypically thought of engaging in. So I wanted to play sports, for example. And I, I felt very kind of disconnected from the, the sports community and from the coaches, and I felt like they weren't encouraging me. There's, I remember one time fairly early on in my career as, as an athlete, one of the coaches like made a joke about how, oh, what are you doing here? You should be going to the, to the math department or going to you know, practice math problems. And I mean, he, he, was, he meant it in like a positive way. I thought, oh, this is like me being really encouraging because I'm saying that math, Chinese people are really good at math. That must be a good thing. But immediately he was setting me apart from everyone else in the room, right? These are the athletes. You're the dork, the geek, who kind of should be set out to the side and really does not belong here. Um, and as a result, I had a really difficult experience in school and uh, even in face some instances of violence that I can share with you at some point if you want to talk to me personally. But, um, Priya, do you want to sure. take the, the stand? And I think some other folks might have some experiences yeah. they can share with you. Um, yeah. So I actually, I was born in India and I came to this country when I was 11 years old, 11 or 12. And unfortunately, the time I came was when September 11th happened and um, high school, or actually, yeah, middle school was definitely very difficult because um, my characteristics, I, you know, I, I could pass for like Middle Eastern, not that Middle Eastern people deserve the kind of um, stereo, stereotyping and discrimination that I faced, but um, high school was very tough, especially because I went to school in a, um, where I was, I went to high school where I was definitely a minority. So I, I didn't, I did not know um, that I could be, you know, treated differently until I went to like community college. And the reason I got involved in animal rights activism is because it was something different. Like for most of my life, I was 
I felt discouraged and did not feel like I could have been leader because I, I felt like I was completely different, had, you know, I felt like I was made to feel less inferior. Um, but, so, so yeah, that's, that was my experience. And when I got involved in the animal rights movement, which was like a year, a year ago, um, one of the first experiences <laughs> Uh, that I went to a circus protest, and you know it was it was a good experience, but I, I definitely felt a little bit of like this is not my place because you know it's it's kind of unusual to see people of um, or especially like you know Indian people I feel like in an animal rights environment. So I I immediately felt that, um, and then I was like you know what I'm just gonna start my own um, group. So my friend Donna, who unfortunately is not here and Danielle and myself and one or two other people but mainly us every Monday met at McDonald's and we did um, we, you know we did like a small demonstration um, so we did this for like I don't know about six seven months but we had to stop because um, there was a lot we faced like a lot of animosity towards uh, to, uh, you know um, directed towards us especially because we were women and we were all women of color and um, it was just difficult because it, it got violent. And I remember this one time, um, unfortunately, this uh, like larger white male tried to like physically assault us. And that's when I was like, okay, I, th we have to stop this. And throughout that, like throughout the protest, we would be really angered because we were we were constantly like nobody is taking us seriously. Of course, like people would make like sexist remarks. Um, but also, you know, the fact that we were women and women of color, we, we definitely felt like this is, like, we're not being taken seriously. So we eventually had to, like, stop doing those because that incident, like, made us fearful um, because, the, you know, we were all, almost physically assaulted. And then, um, yeah, so that, that's just one heavy experience. But then I found direct action everywhere, and I, you know, this is definitely, like, a safe space. And more than that, I feel like for the first time in my life, feel empowered and um, feel like I can be a leader and I can be taken seriously. So TAC, I wanted to invite you. TAC is one of our, one of Direct Action Everywhere's organizers and she has, she herself has had some experiences. So did, did you want to come up here and share? You can share on there too. Okay, you can share. One thing I suggest is if you talk, just we're gonna make sure you elevate your voice so everyone can hear and so the, the camera can also hear because we're gonna record this and post it on YouTube. Um, I guess I'm, I only have one story to share, but um, okay, so when researching for this talk uh, a couple days ago, I, I learned that like, you know, this movement is predominantly white, and a lot of the times, like when I first started off, like I remember the very first thing I ever heard about activism was from Julie Mespel down in um, Orange County, and she was like the first woman who like super inspired me to like get involved, because she told us about how, um, Ellen, that one rich lady from Beverly Hills, and someone else were, were like, well, yeah, Lavendal. They blockaded, like, they, they stood in front of, like, the truck bringing the pigs into Farmer John's slaughterhouse, and then they just stood there and until they got arrested. And I was, like, super inspired by that. I was inspired by the fact that anyone would, like, put themselves on the line for, like, animals that were about to be slaughtered. And I was like, oh, yeah, I want to get involved. And then after reading about how this movement is predominantly white, and, like, white people sort of have this privilege to get arrested and not kind of sort of face the consequences that a person of color would face. So like last, I think it was, I don't even remember what it was, but like a week or two ago, when my acquaintances and I blockaded this building that was approving the KXL pipeline, I noticed like I was the only person of color in our lineup and our experience was wonderful. Like the cops were so pleasant to us. They were like, oh, ha, 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 like, this is great, you're gonna be out in a couple of hours, like, uh, you know, hope you're doing okay, you want a sandwich? Like, they're just like, <laughs> 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 so wonderful to us. And I was like, oh, this is great, am I like being arrested? <laughs> and then, um, and then I like, went back to my lineup, and then I was like, and then like, thinking back on this, I do sort of have, I think I had like this sort of like white privilege of being with a group of white people, and like, and also the fact that I, maybe the fact that I speak English and I probably don't come off as Mexican as I am. So, like, we have this privilege of not having a terrible experience because I'm sure if, like, that lineup had just been, like, a bunch of, like, Latinos or black people, like, it would have been a very different experience. And, like, a lot of people don't realize that, like, this privilege you have of just getting arrested whenever you want is, is, is going to be 
super different coming from like a different place. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You're treated differently by the cops depending on what you look like. Is that it? Yeah. All right. So I actually wanted to open it up to you know various different people because there's a lot of people in this room and um, you know multitude of experiences and voices and um, you know go ahead and share your own experiences regardless of where you come from and um, even if you are not involved in the animal rights movement if you can talk about like you know I know JC you shared with me a couple of days ago uh, while doing research like why you felt like you couldn't be a part of this so we would definitely appreciate that perspective but. Anybody who wants to, you know, share your own stories and experiences, feel free to. Oh, Esther. There is an, another group of people that feel that, you know, I'm going to try to encourage them to become part of the animal rights movement, and that's disabled members of the community. Yes. I, I mean, I saw them over at first Friday. I saw two of them. We'll. we'll Chairs, you know, and they're also under a representative, mm -hmm. and so a representative of that because I've been learning this bill, right. yeah. and the cops have a historic, mm -hmm. historical, or historically guilty of mm -hmm. mistreating disabled. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, like, I have yeah. a friend who's of German background, mm -hmm. and the cops are big at discriminatory in my town, Livermore. And she's disabled, and her mother's a disabled senior, and is German-born. And so they are very unkind to them. And so I would even put people de ableization because no. we're they're having to constantly just fight for their things to get what they're rightfully entitled to. Yeah. So they have to do protests and stuff like that. Yeah, thanks for that perspective, Esther. So um, that's definitely true. There's, you know, ableism exists, and a lot of time, people actually all the time, people who are people who have disabilities are definitely underrepresented. So that is a very important voice to have here. Oh, um, I had uh, spoken with Priyama and JC um, in uh, the volunteer work we do uh, together in SF. Um, but uh, the uh, point, uh, one of the things uh, that uh, uh, she brought up that uh, uh, we talked about is, um, and maybe um, it's more like when we're uh, like when we're poor and minority in the city and whatnot, it, there's not a, um, number one, there's not a, an awareness of a lot of this going on. So there's not necessarily like, I mean, I don't know, there's like, you're, so you're not aware that you are actually being excluded. Uh, number two, um, uh, another thing is, is is being able to, um, like, you know, it's nice getting info on, you know, like, vegan and vegetarian, you know, meals and so forth. And, you know, to know that it's out there. I mean, that's good to know. Um, however, um, you know, to go to like a Whole Foods or anything like that, you know, that's really not like in a budget for, uh, you know, poor people and uh, uh, poor people anywhere in, in the inner city, you know, especially. Um, so, no, I, I think this is, um, I'm glad, you know, to, you know, that I actually, you know, got to, you know, know about this and, you know, kind of find out about it, but it's kind of like just, you know, this is a good, you know, start and, you know, just getting the awareness of this is yeah. going to be a big thing. Yeah. Um, so as we all know, the point JC is making is definitely, you know, something to keep in mind is that the animal rights movement has focused a lot on veganism. So the conversation we were having is about, um, like, the fact that even if, since the focus is primarily on, like, you know, consumerism, how that affects people of color and minorities. So even if these are the basically these are the spaces and communities where like animal rights activism or even like veganism <coughs> is more prominent. So what tends to happen is people of color and minorities who live in San Francisco, um, uh, residential or low income housing, don't find out about these things. They're just like naturally sort of excluded. And um, and of course 
what the point you made about like not being able to afford these foods, it is a, an important one. All right. I don't know your name. Ashel. Hi. Yes, good to be here. Um, yeah, 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 actually, I really appreciate being here and the, in the conversation and the storytelling, the deep storytelling, deep sharing. I've been hearing so far. It's, really it's always good to hear that. Um, and I, I work a, a little in, um, uh, you know, so like the food justice movement, like nutritional education, climate, environment, things like that. And I've sort of seen some parallels between different, um, you know, just like, you know, working in New York. For example, last week, um, they did the 10 cent fee on plastic bags, right? So I was like performing and, and just working with the youth there. And then there's always this conversation, we need to get more people of color into the into this, right? And I think sort of the, I don't know, I think, I don't know if it's sort of like the, the framework of like them getting people of color into something. Like people of color are already sort of in what they're in, you know, in some way. So it's, like even around, like, um, you know, we're talking about like sort of low-income communities in in San Francisco. There are some real parallels that can be drawn when organizing with those communities yeah. with this conversation. It sort of happened to tease out and highlight it in the leadership of that community sort of lift up such that they're like sitting right next to you in this panel, for example. Mm -hmm. Right? And then so it just sort of just some organizing. It's sort of what I've seen, you know, working in New Orleans, just working in where I've been working around the environmental justice movement. Same same issues sort of come up around sort of like how do we be more inclusive and I think um, it just really gets to like a real clear sense of what community is actually dealing with and I think um, you know from that standpoint and really just sort of listening a lot of times too but from that standpoint there automatically arise all these different parallels and opportunities for education and um, you know because it's, it's, it's a powerful parallel like freedom is, is every animal's right and I think it's sort of just um, getting to that point of sort of recognizing what that framework is and how to those parallels. Thank you. Ortega. Uh, my name is Ortega. Um, I come from a very diverse background, so I don't particularly have any one particular slant on um, perspective other than being a person of color, you know, as, I, as I've gotten older. Sorry, as I've gotten older, kind of seeing how um, racism is still kind of very prevalent in the society um, in very subtle ways. Um, there are a lot of people who, in, in my own experience, I've observed just through people I've worked with, people I've spoken with, who are of the mentality that racism is over, and it was over after the 60s and 70s, and then everything else is just kind of like played or you should get over it. Um, we should forget about all of these different legacies. Um, it's as subtle as the only Holocaust being acknowledged is the one of the Jews in World War II, but yet nobody really acknowledges what happened during like colonialism, um, imperialism here, and the people that were here originally, um, and then the other people that were brought here to work, even the Chinese here who were exploited, and you know other other people of color who immigrated here um, just just to make a living, just you know how that works. Um, I think for me, one of my biggest challenges is trying to, um, and actually any, whenever whenever I come to a movement, is feeling unity with the people I'm with. And I've noticed um, one of my, I guess in my personal opinion, one of the reasons that um, there's so little representation among people of color, you know, in this movement. And I, and I, and I know there are a lot of, I know a lot of people of color who are vegans and are very health conscious and they, they practice that and they're really in alignment. And I think that's because the other people that are in the movement that are predominantly not people of color, um, they still participate in racism. And they participate in very subtle ways and they don't acknowledge that there still is a grave economic and social disparity in the society, in the community. And yet, and they still do, as you, as you were bringing up, when you see, see a people of color as sub, subspecies, subhuman, you know, even below anything, even below animals. Or that you know you should get over it. Why don't you guys get right? They don't want to acknowledge the actual systemic, um, the systemic like functions that are in place to keep people where they are. I'm not saying don't hold people accountable, but if you can't see somebody where they're coming from, if you can't see their struggle, if you can't really understand why someone doesn't have their basic human needs met, why they, well, why can't you come to this or do this, do this? Whereas these people are struggling for their nine to fives. If they get, for example. Um, a 
this type of uh, somebody, if a person, a colleague gets arrested at their job, it's it's a whole different. It's, it can be a whole different ball game depending on you know where you're coming from. If you're not a certain, if you're not a professional standing and you're working class, the employer can say you missed a day of work, three strikes and you're out. That person has to really think about that because what happens is soon after, okay, unemployment. You know, you're you're out there trying to find a job. You got to make rent. Um, people, the workplace for people of color is a lot different for people who aren't of that, who are people of European descent. It's totally different. And it's the people say, oh no, it's not, we don't treat you that way. And I think um, people have these very like, archaic senses of what racism is. They think racism is lynching people, spewing slurs, and um, doing this, this, and this. So, you know, keep going, keep going. And they're like, so long as we're not burning crosses on your lawn and doing these things to you, you know, everything's fine, everything's okay. And then there's all these kind of like legal ramifications, like if you're in a job place or any or even in school, um, you have to prove yourself. You have to prove your case for racism. It's just like that's kind of been taken out of the dialogue. Like let's just sweep that under the rug. Social, uh, like socially, um, in society, um, it's even even um, our own people. You know, just just people of color in general, just having to see the ingrained racism that we participate in, and those. those I think the, um, I guess the first step. And actually getting people into a movement is educating the people who are already part of the movement that this is unacceptable if you still participate in this modality of thinking. Yeah. And uh, for example, when I the first time I came here was at um, Thanksgiving and just mm -hmm. downstairs another um, my, my buddy Ian and I, another person of color, faced racism by two women of European descent who greeted us as if we were in the wrong place. And and they, and they looked at us very, very like disgusted, looked at us like very suspicious. We kinda get we got this kind of almost police third degree and I'm just kind of like I smiled at all so I'm like I could take this in a very hard and hurtful way but I'm like this is something I've already because of my own level of awareness I've already decided to encounter and as an ally just kind of it's up to me right and it's always it's always like that for a person of color it's like guilty until proven innocent you got to make the case you got to make the case for your humanity as a person of color and I don't know if other people um, who, who benefit from white privilege in this society and this, the way society was built had that understanding of this is what this is a day to day for us. This is the way of life for us. And though we can, I can have a, you know, I don't necessarily have to see divisions and and, and all these amongst people. And I don't see necessarily, I see people as people. But I am aware that systemically there are systems in place that benefit people. Even me as a man, even myself as a man, um, it's safer for me to walk through certain places at night than it is for women. Um, <coughs> Kelly just brought was bringing up a good point to me about. Um, instead of me as a man, what I would do is teach women how not to get raped, and then she actually brought up that why don't we teach men not to rape? You know, so these types of things is just coming from you know being willing to listen and consider that yeah, things are still we have a lot of work to do, and we are in whatever way, whether I'm a man and I'm a power group in the society and I have power that way, acknowledging my power and privilege and try to figure out how to be an ally, um, and acknowledge that actually sexism and oppression of women still exists. The same goes with people of color and, and then and, and then another species in our own world so that's why they just you know stay out there I'm gonna keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for Yeah, you're right. I mean of course oppression shares shares its roots so <coughs> thank you for yeah. that. Can you remind me of Yes. <laughs> My name is Kevin. Thanks Kevin. and um, I appreciate everything that everyone has said thus far. Mm -hmm. One thing that you just shared made me think about how, like, like Thanksgiving in and of itself, like, how can we actually celebrate a white supremacist holiday, like, in a humane fashion? Like, that's just very questionable, mm -hmm. like, considering, like, whose land we're on. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as, like, my personal experience in terms of, like, with the, in the AR scene, um, I founded the vegan hip hop movement in 2005 or six when I was living in Portland which is the widest major city in the U.S. and also like the most vegan friendly city in the U.S. Um, and it was one motivation to creating the vegan hip hop movement was I was reading Herbivore um, when they had their magazine out and they had this, this hip hop timeline and I was already working on what I call the fresh veg mix so um, hip hop in you know like from the point that I was like you know, coming up in the, the 80s and early 90s, hip hop is what like influenced like my veganism today. But anyway, this this timeline in the magazine suggested that it must have been John Robbins who who, who ghost wrote Dead Prez's Be Healthy lyrics. Mm -hmm. 
so suggested that you know there's no way that these brown men could even like come up with you know John Brock yeah like <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly and so so from that point I just realized that the voice um, you know the voice of hip hop had to be heard and so that's why the big hip hop if you don't know who John Robbins is, he's <laughs> the heir to the, the Baskin Robbins fortune. <laughs> White guy, you know, like, you know, son of executives. And, I mean, he's an activist, he's an environmentalist, yeah. but yeah. not a good top artist. That's crazy. Right, um, how, if you don't mind me asking, how are you involved in the vegan hip hop movement? Or? Well, so I founded the vegan hip hop okay. movement. Okay, yeah. wow. And, and, and so, so through that, like, I promote, you know, like, obviously hip hop. Um, but through, well, so veganism through the lens of hip-hop, like, awesome. again, considering, like, hip-hop from its inception, folks of color have been expressing, like, their, their lifestyle, their, their food ways, you yeah. know, so, so just bringing that other voice. That's I cool. like what your shit says. Thank you. <laughs> the top part's in Spanish and in the bottom. Yeah. English? Yeah. So for those of you who are watching, it says no human being is illegal. In yeah. Spanish and English. An error. An error. An error. Sorry. Others? This might actually be a good segue into the next step. Okay, should it? So, you want to jump for it? Did you want to? Yeah. Um, so, I, I think this is a great segue because a lot of the stories that have been shared up to this point uh, have been about our experiences of racism, even within the animal rights movement. And that leads us to the next point, which is that. Notwithstanding the fact that there are these really powerful parallels, and I think there are these shared stories, and I will say is, in my years, 15 years as an animal rights activist, I always found when I leafleted or did protests on the south side of Chicago, I got so much more sympathy, so much more understanding than I did in Lincoln Park and like the ritzy, luxury, nice areas of Chicago. People would be dismissive, they didn't like protesters, and they certainly did, didn't like me suggesting there might be something problematic about animal agriculture was an industry which is an industry that's run you know, by white America basically um, especially food companies like McDonald's, Chipotle, mm -hmm. Burger King, these are all white run companies but in the African American, Latino, Chinese communities everyone was really receptive and people listen they take leaflets and they actually engage and so there is this powerful parallel and there's this you know powerful alliance that can be developed between these communities and yet you know as everyone's shared today less than three percent of this movement is is is, is 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 represented by people of color um, relative to our general population in the United States, where you know 37 percent of the general population in the United States is is a uh, racial minority. So we're underrepresented by a factor of 12. Um, and the figures are even worse in leadership positions. And I mean, you can just think to yourself, like, think about the animal rights movement and who the prominent leaders of the animal rights movement are. I mean. I can't really think of anyone. The only person I can think of off the top of my head is Lorna Nellis at the Food Empowerment Project. Other than that, is there anyone? And, you know, there, I worked as a corporate lawyer for many years, and I've seen the policies that corporate America has even put in place to make sure that we're affirmatively engaging minority communities, making sure we're actually screening and looking at minorities in addition to white people for people for positions of influence and authority. Um, and, and minorities are still dramatically underrepresented. So, for example, Asian Americans are underrepresented by a factor of 16 in business leadership positions. And yet, the animal rights movement, I, I'd suggest, I would suggest, and I don't have any statistics to prove this, that we're doing even worse than corporate America. And when we're not doing as well as corporate America, to me, that's suggestive that we're not doing enough. Um, so, why, why is this important? Well, you might say, well, you know, there aren't that many people of color who are interested in animal rights. You know, as long as the people who are currently involved are doing good work, it doesn't really matter if we have representation. I think that's just a false position, and there are a couple of reasons for this. As we've already noted, the world is filled with people of color. <laughs> in America, we like to think of the world as white-run, white-controlled, even if you look at Hollywood and the media, it's entirely white people, for the most part. But the reality, even in the state of California, is now that California is a majority minority state. Internationally, the picture is even more salient and important for us to consider minority perspectives. Mandarin Chinese, for example, we like to think of English as the lingua franca of the world and that everyone speaks English. Yet, Mandarin Chinese alone has tripled the number of native speakers of any European language. The second most prominent language in the world is Spanish, which again is a language that's spoken by people of color in the world. So, even the fact that we use this language to spread our message is suggestive of the fact that we're not serious about trying to change the world. Mm. Um, the final point to make is that if we're serious about changing the world, we have to start by changing local communities. And there's 
a wonderful professor at Harvard named Nicholas Krasakis, who's done a lot of research in this area. What he basically shows is that you can bombard people from, with information, with advertising, with reasoning, even stories and media all you want. But if there isn't buy-in from a local community, you're not going to have much success. On the other hand, if you do get influential members of the local community to start changing, then you can start changing that local community. And by changing the local community, start to change the world. So, um, there's a famous quote by a politician named Tip O'Neill, the former Speaker of the House, and he, the quote is that all politics is local. Um, what I would like to do is translate that to animal rights activism and anti-racist activism and say that all activism is also local, ultimately. And if we can't change local communities, we can't change the world. So, the fact that we're not representing all these diverse communities all the world is a problem. So how do we start to include minorities? Well, I think the first thing we can do is acknowledge that there is a gap that needs to be filled. Right? And we're doing that today. A lot of the comments that have been shared with the group today are, are, are doing that as well. And I think it's important that we continue doing that. Um, second is to include policies, including, I think, express policies, to try and include underrepresented voices. And I know affirmative action is controversial in, in the broader community, not as controversial within the animal rights movement. But it's interesting. I think most of us probably support <coughs> affirmative action in the abstract. But within the movement itself, we don't actually exercise it. We don't think about it at all. And the point of, for affirmative action that is really important for me and, and from the literature that I've read as an economics and social science researcher is it's not about favoring people of color or any other group. It's about giving them an opportunity to be on a level playing ground. Right? It's, mm -hmm. it's about the fact that acknowledging the fact that there already is a cognitive and psychological gap in our perception. When we look into a room and see all these white faces and one person of color, we're already going to immediately dismiss that person of color. What we need to do is make sure we don't do that. And that's the point of having policies where it, it, I, we don't have quotas in direct action ever, for example, but when we meet someone who's a person of color, when we meet someone from a community that's not the same as all the other members of our community, we always make an effort to try and talk to them and integrate them into our, into our community because we understand that there's this natural psychological cognitive process that often prevents us from connecting with them. Um, invite underrepresented voices to share their experiences. So if you're, if you're doing a campaign against the Chinese, you know, and, and you notice that everyone in the room is white, Try and find somebody who's Chinese, you know, and listen to what they might have to say about this campaign, because you might learn how, about how to be more effective with Chinese people, even aside from ethics. It might be pragmatically important for you to do that. Yeah. We can actually talk, um, share, so the Elephant March, I know a lot of us were involved. One of the things that we really appreciated, I'm sure you appreciate it this way, is that um, the organizers um, asked, asked Wayne to like share his perspective, and, and they asked him to speak in Chinese, and that makes the world's difference, because this is somebody who comes from this culture, and it's not just like, other people from who are not Chinese going into the, the you know going China into Chinatown town. and like taking over. So having Wayne there and having him speak, it, it makes it makes such a difference because it's not just like other people or how it's perceived by the Chinese community telling you like this is wrong and this is not okay, but it's actually somebody who shares their language and speaking in their language. Yeah. Um, Literally. Yeah, you know, that, that, goes, that speaks volumes. Yeah. So, I mean, in Chinatown, there's still a significant portion of the population that doesn't even speak English. Yeah. And if you're um, coming into Chinatown and, and no one even, can even speak the language of the people, you're not going to have a lot of speech. Yeah. Can you also speak Cantonese, too? I can understand it a little. I can say a few phrases. I'm not as good with it. Well, yeah. Is, yeah. I'm not as good at Cantonese as I am with Mandarin. I just, I just want to point out that even more so than that, Noel came to our tabling event yeah. during the Chinese... New Year parade, not parade, and um, tabling in the in the big street festival, and and she speaks both Mandarin and Cantonese and talked for two solid days to people because a lot of people who go there from mm -hmm. yeah. elsewhere and they don't speak English. Yeah. and it was it was absolutely fabulous because mm -hmm. the 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 the, ex the expression of um, recognition, you know, the one woman I she just looked at me, shaking her head like I pointed to Noel. And a big smile on her face when Noel spoke to her. And it was just this world. Yeah. And just to provide everyone some context, the Elephant March yeah. is part of a campaign yeah. to stop the extinction of the right, wild African elephant, which is, elephant, which is probably going to happen in the next 10 years. Yeah. And China, unfortunately, is the world's number one ivory consumer right now. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the ivory, in fact, I think all the ivory that's being sold in San Francisco, at least, is sold in Chinatown. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think it's easy to kind of demonize Chinese people and say that that means we should be opposed to them. But realistically, if you actually want to change these communities, as Jean's story so powerfully demonstrates, you need someone who's actually Chinese. Literally, you're not even going to be able to communicate with these people 
and you cannot speak their language, and if you don't have an understanding of their culture background. And one of the wonderful things about the organizers of this march is, notwithstanding the fact that none of the key organizers are Chinese, there are actually, the woman who's kind of leading up the entire operation is a person of color herself, which is probably why I think she's more sensitive on these issues and sought out feedback from Chinese people. But one of the wonderful things they did was actually consciously seek out Chinese voices. I mean, they, they sought out them all, asked them all, hey, can you table for us? They came to me and said, like, hey, can you speak for us? Because we want to be effective in this community. We want to understand mm -hmm. your perspective on this issue as a person of color and as someone's Chinese. So, and I, I just want to add that I, it wasn't just that Nateri was Sri Lankan. We, yeah. we all, we all hey, I'm not saying it's just Nateri. No, I know. I know. But I think I'm sure that influenced her that, perspective that, yeah, in some sure ways. Does, sure does. So. Yeah. Um, and so finally, the, you know, in addition to kind of including their voices, sharing, asking them to share their experiences, just create a general culture of inclusion. Um, because I think if you have a cultural exclusion, there are all these subtextual ways where you'll almost incidentally or accidentally start excluding people systematically because they're different from you in ways that you don't even notice. And again, there's so much literature and subconscious bias and how even the way we relate to each other, the body language. So even if you think of yourself as completely anti-racist, as completely feminist, there are just subtextual ways that maybe you don't even acknowledge that you interact differently when someone's a person of color or someone's an immigrant or someone doesn't speak the same language that you speak. You know, like that was one of the troubles I faced when I was growing up, you know, that I, even when I felt like people stopped doing things that were explicitly racist against me, you could just tell in their body language because I, I didn't learn to speak English extremely well until like 9, 10, 11 years old, so my first four years in school, and I was constantly kind of just dismissed, and I could tell like the way they turn their shoulders, the way they don't look at you in the eye, mm -hmm. the way they, the conversation with you are always very short, you know, like, oh, you know, I'll just say three words and move on to someone else. Yeah. And, and there are all these little subtextual things that happen to you when you're a person of color, and we need to try and avoid that if we're going to integrate these people into our communities, which we need to do. Yeah. Um, before you move on, can I just say something? Yeah, well, why don't we, you two, you okay. can take it over. So okay. Priya's going to facilitate. Uh, okay, so, okay, so we try to focus a lot on intersectionality, and of course in this movement there is a lot of like talk about you know, intersection of oppression. And when we talk about intersectionality, it's really important that, you know, not just not just like um, we, that we seek actively seek people who are uh, you know people of color and who who actually have had those experiences to come and share those stories. So I can I can talk all I want about like my experiences at work and how like I share with my tenant organizers um, and I work in a low income housing uh, setting in San Francisco and I can talk I can talk about that but I, I don't think that goes as you know, that carries as much weight as somebody who has actually experienced and who lives there and come and share their stories because that is being actively intersectional as opposed to just me talking about like, oh, this is how I myself, you know, am intersectional. So actively seeking people who have had those experiences. Um, so we wanted to invite people to share their stories of inclusion and exclusion. And um, also I think, you know, one thing that's really important is uh, you know, tell us like how you think that we can be more inclusive. Um, how this movement can be more inclusive, because um, obviously um, we just talked about how it's it's not as inclusive as it could be, and there's not that many people of color. So how can we change that as a community? So I, I'm just going to share one one quick story. It's notwithstanding the fact that. I mean, obviously, I, I have a lot of connections and relationships with now as an animal rights activist, and I've been doing this for 15 years. But for close to, I'd say, the first five or six years that I tried to do animal rights activism, people basically dismissed me out of hand. Like it was, mm -hmm. And it wasn't because I wasn't hardworking or passionate or devoted. I was. I mean, I, when my first dog died, I decided I was going to commit my life to helping animals however I could, because she was my best friend when I was growing up, and really my only friend in a community that was very hostile to me. And it still like, makes me a little emotional thinking about her. And, how much she influenced me. Um, but it took like five years for me even to realize that there were organizing committees and groups that were meeting and discussing events and planning events that I could be a part of. Because it didn't even occur to people that they should ask me. I mean, I was coming to literally every protest and every leafling event, every discussion by every group in the city, and no one even bothered to ask me. It, and I was also, you know, I was in many ways, you would think, oh, this is like a distinguished student. I was going to the University of Chicago, which in Chicago is known as like the prestigious university. You know, I was, I was very hardworking, responsible. Whenever someone contacted me, I would respond immediately, and I was always like asking to help out however I could. And it took five years, basically, for anyone to ask me, like, "Oh, would you be interested in helping us out in a more substantive way, where we hear your voice and you have some, you can contribute in some more meaningful way than just coming to a protest and holding a sign?" You know, and so I, I don't think. And one point I want to emphasize is when we talk about institutional oppression, whether it's racism or speciesism, 
And this is one of the reasons we don't focus on vegan consumerism. It's not about individual mass. <laughs> it's not like I think any of those particular individuals, I think all the individuals in the Chicago Animal Rights Movement, these are individuals who I'm, I'm incredibly close friends with now. Each of them as individuals is probably a really good anti-racist person. But the problem is there's, there's all these very subtle cultural dimensions to racism and speciesism that we're not appreciating. And so for like, for example, one of the reasons I think most people don't think they can become animal rights activists is because, it's because structurally and, and, and economically, we're not giving people the options, right? We haven't, there isn't enough momentum behind animal rights that these options are even available in a cheap and convenient way. Instead, you have to go to Whole Foods, right? or you have to go to Millennium, you have to go to one of these really expensive restaurants. And so I think if, if we focus on violence, exploitation, and oppression, then we can convince people from all different communities this is something they, want, they should be involved in. If we focus on consumer purity and, and how we're, you're not as good as us and you have to shop at Whole Foods, then obviously that's going to be very antagonizing to anyone who's already struggling to meet their to, mm -hmm. to meet their budget, you know, to, to put food on the table. Um, so yeah, I think there's there's a lot of really important intersections that we have to explore. Okay. Um, do you want to talk about the open model a little bit? Yeah. So the the open model is kind of an approach that we explicitly take, and you know the the, the big picture point of the open model is that we are a community that's built on trying to grow our community. And if you're built on, if you're if you're organizing principle is we want to grow, then you have to be inclusive. You have to be able, you have to be transparent. And so we actively try and engage people. But you know, three dimensions in which we definitely do this are one, cultural or ideological disagreement. I mean, if there's some cultural or ideological disagreement between someone in our community and someone outside the community, our perspective is not oh you're bad. It's let's listen and let's integrate you. And you can still be a part of our community notwithstanding this disagreement. And maybe we can. Maybe we can both educate each other and come to some sort of better understanding of this issue where we both change in an important way. Uh, another is vegan consumer purity. I mean, I think there are a lot of animal rights groups that the moment you come into their community, they say, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad, if you're not meeting this test of consumer purity. I think all of us in this room who have been dedicated animal rights activists have been vegan. We're not saying that veganism is important. It is, symbolically. It's incredibly important to show the consistency in your, uh, of, your, of your practices with your values. But at the same time, I think there has to be an appreciation of the fact that you know, realistically, most people aren't making choices for themselves. In our world, the choices that we're getting are choices foisted upon us by big multinational corporations that are setting options down for us. We're not making those choices, and if we're not, we're not making those choices, it's really hard to blame people for the choices they're making, because they're not the ones who are setting down the options. And then finally, I think just in terms of communities, I think we're very self-cognizant of the fact that all communities, and there's, as, as a behavioral scientist, I can tell you this is 100% true and across all different domains, Bubbles tend to develop, and if you're not self-conscious about the fact that a bubble is developing and the fact that there probably are identity attributes of your particular community that are leading you to exclude other people, then you're not going to be successful expanding. And again, going back to the fact that our organizing premise is that we want to expand our movement, you have to acknowledge the fact that we are probably in a bubble. Let's think about ways we can pop that bubble so we can spread our ideas to other people and also learn from other people, too. So again, we just wanted to invite people to share their stories of inclusion and exclusion. I know that Ortega, you shared yours about Thanksgiving. That was super powerful um, and you know unfortunate. And um, but but we also want to invite people to share their if you have you know felt included um, by us or other other groups in this uh, in this movement. We would we would love to hear from you. Um, Ortega, add to that, um, I think what kept what kept me coming back was um, just you weighing and, and being a person of color. Um, and one of the things like. You know, just being of Chinese descent, and how um, even in my mind, in society, there's like this, there's a stereotype that you know, people, people of like either Chinese or Asian descent are just quiet, you know, just mm -hmm. push off to the side, not going to say. And then, not only, and then when I see you, I'm like, okay, still somewhat skeptical. But then when you acknowledge me and said we need, we need to have more people of color represented here, you know, then I said, okay, this is this dude is legitimate. He's not pretending as if this isn't an issue. He's not over here pretending. He's not a person of color himself, or that racism doesn't exist. So that's full highly um, of your integrity, your awareness, and as and anybody else who has that, who, who maintains that consciousness. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not perfect in what my perception because why would I be surprised to see you? But why should I have been surprised when you told me, um, oh hey, you know, yeah, hey, there's people of color. We need to. I was I was shocked to hear you say that. Mm -hmm. I was shocked and relieved. I was like, oh wow, because I had other perceptions in my mind. About you know based on my other like interactions with other people of color from mm -hmm. other other groups and there's I think um, in order to, to make any movement work we have to have that solidarity you know, understanding of yeah of all our differences and our struggles that we individually deal with and really show as best we can to show up for those people.
you know, and the allies, not to say we have to try to save their life, that's a different thing, but just as, as supporting and acknowledging someone's humanity, we need more as people overall. So we you know, really move forward in that way. It's interesting. Just thank you so much for that yeah. phrase. It's totally not justified because I think it's part of the culture we're creating. It's not just me, for sure. But one, one thing, I, one reason I did that was because I, I, there's such a huge contrast. I, I started out not doing anti activism, but doing anti-racism and anti-capital punishment work in Chicago. And this is a largely African-American community. And there's a contrast in my experience with the animal rights movement where I felt like they were happy to use me, but not so happy to integrate me into the community. Yeah. But in the African-American communities on the South Side, like people were talking to me like a real person. I was like, wow, like I'm this like, dorky Chinese guy with thick glasses and he's always carrying books around and like back then I always wore like polo shirts and dress shirts coming into these like really rough neighborhoods really concerned about this issue and you guys are excited to see me you know it isn't like who's this weird guy who's like really stiff and you know like I was I, I was a really shy person then I did fit most of the stereotypes of black Chinese people when I was like 18 19 years old and but nonetheless they were excited they wanted to hear me and thought this is great this guy this guy can be a resource you know like he's a University of Chicago student so he has all these library resources he can do all this research that, that maybe we can't do because we don't have the privileges that he has as a university student. And so the perspective was so different. So like, I totally appreciated that and felt like I was embedded in the South Side community in Chicago. And so I, I always think back to that contrasting experience and say to myself, like, if I want to be a good activist and good organizer, I need to take the same approach that those African American activists took to me. Yeah. And like when I started out as an activist of any time. I mean, that was my first experience of activism. So I, I think it's vital. Yeah. So um, I want to share something that is not really entirely about racism, but it's actually more about sexism. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't really have a lot of statistics about it, but at UCLA, there was this student group, Bruins for Animals, and I actually was at heavily a part of it, and I was even co-president for quite a few years. Um, and it was like almost entirely comprised of women. And um, from what I found, it's painfully difficult to get men interested in the animal rights movement. Um, and I do know that there are plenty of like men who are animal rights people, but um, I think um, it was really difficult to get people interested in our very small organization. And I actually, um, back then I wasn't so much interested in feminism, but now that I'm more interested in feminism, I sort of realize the sort of um, you see things. Yeah, it, it was it was sort of more like um, let me just share a little thing. So um, many of your liberationists they might not like what I did, but because I'm a reformist kind of sometimes. But um, um, I got UCLA to use cage free eggs in the dining hall and to sort of celebrate um, while I was working with the dining halls. We me and Bruins for Animals would sort of go outside the dining halls and be like, yay, it's cage-free eggs now, and that kind of cooler. Um, and I made this sign, and it was like, UCLA chicks for chicks. Uh -huh. And I probably wouldn't do that anymore because it's just like, and actually there was this, <laughs> one of my friends, Tommy, he was like, I'm not going to like be there with that sign, not because he was a guy, but because it was sexist. And I wasn't realizing how sexist I was being. And a lot of our discussion when we were just chatting in our in Burns for Animals was um, I don't know how to put it, but it it was um, it was very like girly oriented. I don't know how to put it, but I, I think because there's just a, such a social dichotomy between men and women, if you're very stereotypically girly. It's very difficult to get people interested in your organization, and I also was in part of, in a atheist organization, and it was painfully difficult to get women involved in that. Mm -hmm. And I felt myself as kind of an outsider, mm -hmm. and like my ideas and stuff weren't as legitimate. Mm -hmm. um, and I was very much sort of like typecasted mm -hmm. as that because I was bubbly. They thought of me as some ditzy girl, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? So um, even though I'm incredibly intelligent, so um, so. That's my story sort of about sexism involved in the yeah. animal rights community. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the point was really. But yeah. We were talking about the last month about intersectionality. Yeah, and it's, it actually hasn't been posted yet, but it should be posted soon. We, the, our audio visual person is working on syncing oh. the audio and the video because they're different tracks and that's some trouble. But it should go up soon. 
Thanks. Yeah. Nina? Uh, a story of inclusion that I have is that since coming to DXE, I really appreciate that you acknowledge me, not just as just an Asian person, but to go, you know, it's just like there are different parts than you know in the Asian race. Yes. And so I <laughs> acknowledge that. Wait, we're not all the same. No, no, we're not all the same. Exactly. No, I thought we were all the same. Which is, which is wonderful um, because, like, <laughs> Wayne and I come from different backgrounds because. Uh, my family um, is part of the Vietnamese war refugees, and his family is Chinese immigrants, and Priya's family is from India. So um, I love that that is acknowledged, because our experiences, even within yeah. um, a race, is so mm -hmm. drastically different yeah, from each other's. Mm -hmm. um, I also like that in the March for Elephants, that was acknowledged as well, mm -hmm. that um, you know Wayne and Noel could reach out mm -hmm. to people who spoke Chinese, whereas I could reach out to people who spoke Vietnamese. Yeah. Thanks, Mina. Kevin? I think, I think intentionality is really important, too. Like, I think individually and as a group, it's important to, to um, have privilege or privileges in check. You know, because before we can, like, like, fully include everyone or whatever, we also have to, like, work on our own issues yeah. and, again, as a group. Um, and aside from that, like, I think we should also respect exclusion. Like, for instance, I've been in different like physical or virtual spaces where they were intentional about like it was like vegans of color or mm -hmm. you know where you want you have like white folks like kind of entering those spaces virtually or otherwise um, just because it says vegan or whatever mm -hmm. but not respecting the fact that you've got some, some folks who are like from the African diaspora or whatever like the case may be like respect <coughs> that space and and enter when you're invited to I suppose. It's, it's a good point, and we're actually going to be starting an animal liberation support group that is specifically focused on trying to give people of color an opportunity to share their experiences and, and even the traumas they go through as not just people of color, but pe as people of color within the animal rights movement. And I'd certainly invite all the people of color in this movement to participate. And, and the people who are not people of color, I mean, participate too as allies, understanding that you know, the focus of this group is animal liberation of color, not just animal liberation. So. But it's something we'll be planning in the next few weeks, and it's going to be probably just a social gathering at first. We might have a continuing series where we talk about subjects like this, and mm -hmm. you know how we can improve both our society with respect to racism and, and anti-racism. <coughs> yeah, to, to start that off, you can plug into the, the Cali Vegans of Color on yeah. Facebook. Yeah, yeah. 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 There's a friend of mine who yeah. started oh. that up. So. Oh, awesome. Yeah. I didn't know you wanted to come. Yeah. Oh. Fantastic. Oh. Cool. That's crazy. Um, no. Yes. Yeah. Just to kind of what Kevin said, like something that I would like to add maybe to the last slide is that the accountability that white people need to have for themselves. Like as a white person, I feel like we have to do this work to mm -hmm. understand how we are perpetuating the racist system mm -hmm. that we're all living in, and um, like holding each other accountable as white people coming together to like study and unlearn, you know, everything that um, that has educated us in this be this way, right? I think that's like a huge part of um, making the community inclusive. Yeah. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and I want to encourage everybody to speak up. So Chris, I know you had your hand up. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's interesting. I mean, there's obvious, you know, racial and uh, gender uh, discrimination, but the language discrimination, like, it's, you know, sometimes we just have to be really patient because um, sometimes, and especially if there's, like I know in this room it gets really loud sometimes, mm -hmm. we'll have like, you know, seven or eight different conversations going on at the same time, but, uh, yeah, like, uh, we had someone the other day that we just, you know, I felt like we should just slow everything down, uh, to listen to Lee for a minute, and like, I know for me, like, I have a lot of practice with this, because I have, it's, it's horrible that I don't speak Spanish, I think, and, you know, but, at the same time, maybe I don't really think it's horrible because I never bothered to learn it. <laughs> if I actually thought it was, but it's un, maybe it's unfortunate. But like all my elders in my family on my mom's side, they all speak Spanish, and um, some of the, some of the relatives, uh, especially from Mexico, don't speak English. And so when I visit with them, like you know, I have to really practice my Spanish, and like, and or if their their English is just really not good, and I just have to really like sit and be really quiet and just really try to understand what they're saying and um, so like I feel like I've had a lot of practice at this and I feel like I'm still really not good at it and like I think I'm 
or at least not as good as I feel like I should be. Like, I feel like I'm pretty good at it, but I, I feel like I should be better. And um, I should just also learn Spanish. But, but, this, <laughs> but, uh, but that also would help with all of these other languages. Like, this, this person I'm referring to, I don't, he may, may have spoken Spanish, but I don't think so. But, um, so that's, that's just something, you know, and sometimes even people who speak English, who even their native language is English, but they came from a different city or a different, you know, state, and, and, uh, and so sometimes it's hard to understand people who are speaking just in a different way or different dialect than we're used to. Uh, and like, you know, I remember listening to someone from the Bronx, and I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I did not know he was speaking English, like, <laughs> it was at a union meeting, and um, so uh, there's a lot of things that we just need to be mindful of and try to like work, work on like as individuals, you know. So. Yeah, that's a really good point, Chris, it's not just like understanding people who speak different languages, but sometimes like we were, or we were talking about our environment automatically thinks that people who speak like perfect English, whatever that means, mm -hmm. are, have more authority. Mm -hmm. So like inviting voices, even though they don't, they speak, you know, whatever we call broken English, mm -hmm. that's fine. But you, you yeah. still deserve to have your perspective mm -hmm. shared. Um, sometimes I feel like I don't speak, you know, English properly and I, I get conscious about my accent. But I think that it's, things I have to say are important and I think everybody who, who, fe who sh um, speaks another language should feel the same way. Yes. I just, to, I, just, I just wanted to piggyback on the language and the communication topic. Um, I know a lot of times when I enter a space or a community, people have, people can't figure out how to identify me. Okay. So they'll talk to me. They'll talk to me. <laughs> they'll talk to me in a way that's very disrespectful. Mm -hmm. They'll come mm -hmm. and talk to me in some kind of some place that doesn't represent where they're from. Like they'll talk to me from like like they're from like they'll, they'll basically take some words from a lap rap song. <laughs> 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 And it's, and it's very disrespectful. Yeah. It's just kind of like, you know, how do how do I put this in a good way? And it's really hard to really just like acknowledge and take somebody seriously. I'm like this. I know who I know. My people. I know where you're from. Like, if you're from there, you're from. <laughs> if you're not from there, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna come misrepresent them. I'm not gonna talk to anybody if they speak another language. I'm not gonna come out and talking to them slowly. I'm not gonna try to speak to that experience. I'm gonna come loud. Where I'm from. I might speak to somebody else a little differently because we have a commonality experience. But there is a base way of addressing people. Please address everybody in that base way until you know where they are from and you feel that comfortable. It's not acceptable for you to, to, to type cast or stereotype me and think I speak Sorry. a certain way or dialect. And even if I do, if I don't speak that with you and you're not from there, we're not going to speak that language unless I know you. Because that's, 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 like, that's, like, that's almost like a perpetration or a violation. Mm -hmm. Like if I talk to you straight, don't come to me. Just trying to be cute, like some kind of hip hop. It's very disrespectful. It's extremely racist. No, 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 it's cool. No, it's cool. No, it's cool. But you can laugh. But this is what happens. I know. It's I like know. a common thing. Or like loud. Loud. Unless you, not yeah, unless you're from there. Would you like a sandwich? Yeah. No, not no, any no. of those types of things. Any of those types of things. But yeah. Yeah, and I base that, I base that like on a regular, and I usually, um, I can just kind of bypass it, but especially with, um, People who are people of color or people who have different experiences, like socially and economically. Oh, yeah. I'm like, speak to where you're from. I, I see you. Don't mm -hmm. speak to me as if you're trying to appeal to me or speak to me like whether you're speaking to me slowly, you're speaking to me with a certain drawl or a certain type of what you call <laughs> slang or what you think is slang. Because you know that's not that's totally unacceptable. It's yeah. not acknowledging you know of that person's humanity. It's it's like it's, you make a spectacle of who they are, as if they're some kind of creature or something like we're at a free show. I'm so fascinated by them. Let me speak their language. Yeah. You know, we're from very extraterrestrials all of a sudden. You know, fetishization <laughs> of you know, have, just seeing it, seeing people in that way is just really not acceptable. Yeah. We need to really reflect upon how we interact with people. I know I'm kinda O C D about things I think all the time as I speak, right? Um, but I'm I'm always, you know, making the effort and I can make a lot more efforts in general in a lot of places. So at least make that base effort. Mm -hmm. To say, hey, I'm going to come be you, be who you are, communicate from where you can, where you can. And if you don't know, try to understand, but don't necessarily um, approach somebody with these assumptions. Mm -hmm. It's not like I'm not going to talk to Wayne upon seeing him, and you know, just you know, talk. Try to <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to talk to him in English? Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Drop all the verbs? Yeah, exactly. yeah. Chinese people don't use verbs. Right? So you just have to move no verbs. Exactly. It's so it, painful it, people it, do this. Yeah. They're like, exactly. you like food? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
and add in the other parts, parts of speech. I understand English. It happens in Chinatown. You have so much extra damage for being in Indiana. I just want to add that, unfortunately, it's it's not that people are. That's just not, that's a yeah, normal thing. A lot of times they're trying to do good. Oh, know, so absolutely, you can't even get, and that's what's it's yeah. more frustrating. We laugh because it seems glaring to us, yeah. but but especially in the Midwest. But people yeah. just don't. They don't. It doesn't. Isn't even something they. They stop and think. I should think about this. Mm -hmm. So it's unless conscious. what? It's yes, yeah. and so unless they have pe it, are in a discussion like this to mm -hmm. think, oh, right, it just isn't. A, it just isn't a so we have to be patient with them. Like, and even when we speak in Spanish, you know, like I, my grandmother's Mexican, I don't speak Spanish, mm -hmm. but I don't make any extra effort to put up a front yeah. to reach yeah. out to my Latino brothers and sisters. You know, yeah. in that kind of way. You know, I, I just come from my front. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, 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 that's like it's like base these base things, and it's part of education is a big part. Uh, education, yeah, education is of like what, what it looks like for the other person, mm -hmm. how that feels, so we can really have the opportunity to participate in everything. Mm -hmm. It's also practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, even when yeah. you know, you still have to. Yes. Yeah. I, I I'd like to add one more thing. This might be completely tangential, way too academic, but um, I was reminded <coughs> the other day when I came across this article. That, the race really is a social construct, mm -hmm. and when people say that, they think, well, what do you mean? You know, black people, white people, but, um, you know, in, most people don't know the social history sort of thing in the United States, but there's, there's a great book that came out a number of years ago called How the Irish Became White, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. in this article I saw, it actually started out talking about Paul Ryan and his recent ridiculous comments, but, but the bulk of the article is, is all about that and the history of this and that. You know, in the 19th century, Irish and Slavs and Jews were not considered white. And then there was actually active discussion, deciding among some groups who was going to be white now. <laughs> one was like, oh, you know, one weird commentary. I just, I, I, I'm not as well versed in this as I once was, but um, just cursorily looking at that article yesterday. That there were actually conversations amongst like spokespeople saying, well, you know, the Irish have lost some of their their sort of grotesque features, so maybe they could be considered white now. So so all of it is just is because we tend to people toss around the word race as if it's a real thing and it really is not. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to it's sort of academic, yeah. but it's um, yeah, thank something to remember even, you know, just Yeah, thanks Jean. Um, yeah. that reminds me of a quote, difference is not uh, is not found, it's created. It's yes. not, it does not mm -hmm. exist in like our physical environment, yeah. something yeah. that's created socially. And what you said, Ortega, too, like it's it's important to acknowledge people, especially people of color, to the extent that it's helpful, but mm -hmm. to do it in a way that's going to you know, right. make them feel like even more right. um, otherwise, it's, it's detrimental. Uh, hi, some of my best friends are Indian. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 yeah. I, we hear that. Yes. Yeah. That's um, uh, what he was saying. Okay, oh, sorry. That's fine. Uh, no, what he was saying just reminded me of the t-shirt I just saw at the T.L. liquor store, not to, to uh, one of the guys who wearing it, says, if you don't know me, don't bro me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, just yeah, exactly what he, yeah. the man, I was like, where'd you get that? Yeah. 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 Like, where did you get that? I was like, oh, I, I mean, he was over here in the East Bay somewhere, but it's like, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's, that's just like, you know, yeah, it's, I mean, and, and again, I think it's more often than not unconscious, Yeah. but you know, it's just like, you know, hey, yeah. Hey, bro. <laughs> hey, dude. You know, it's just like, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, uh, it's like, hey, what's up? What's up? Yeah, you know, it's just like, they're trying. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. They're trying. There must be a way to respond to that, though, without um, getting angry and saying, you know, oh, no, we don't get right. no, 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 no. I mean, but, but how? What do you say? What do you? <laughs> what do you say besides <laughs> the After I, what, that? You know, what can you say that will make, get them thinking? After you're done laughing inside. Right. <laughs> Because it must be, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. just so easy to just to just think, oh, and, and ignore it, and, you know, right. away or something. Um, so, just, I mean, it, with women as well, it's mm -hmm. like, you need the split like, second. You can just say, that's so cute. Oh. How you losing it? Or how um, cute of you to try. <laughs> is it Ashel? Yes, Ashel, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this conversation got me thinking about, um, yeah, this is really, it's a complex conversation. Um, even that, like, yeah, I think that's really good. You get a Western response, because then, okay. then you're in a, state, you're in a space of perpetuating mm -hmm. and exclusivity yeah. and just in a split second, right? Mm -hmm. And then, um, so I'm just listening to, like, you know, what the power is in terms of, like, the overall conversation. <coughs> the power is 
in any relationship is the intimacy, right? Like what you let go of, um, and the compassion and empathy and the transparency that we're hearing right now. And how did that, that become like a popular movement in itself is something that's really revolutionary in the sense of all these different movements that are the tangents were connected to this. Um, compassion in general, right? So I, I'm just really listening for that, to raise that, to see where that can go. Because then that's really, a, I mean, to me, that's where the seed of it is. And then so, um, you know, for example, like I was like, I was hiking the other day, I was, um, in Joaquin Miller Park. I mean, I experienced this a lot of times because I, I, I got like being in nation. At first, the first time, it, it, it was really interesting because I was like, with a friend of mine, he's a uh, white guy. We were in Yosemite and we were walking up and this like white couple came down and they like talked directly to him about the direction. But I know the yeah. park really well. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy had no idea. They were like, well, we need directions to so-and-so. Like and I was just, there. Yeah, and it was really interesting. But after a while, you know, something, I don't know, like, I think, you know, I, I definitely engage in, it is different like sort of spiritual practices I sort of engage in, and, 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 and it's always a continual like process of trying to heal um, reaction, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, such that the, in a Buddhist sense, like the perpetuation, the reaction, the perpetuation of that actually creates more of that mm -hmm. in some way. So it's really sensitive conversation, I mean, really, if we're really serious about creating liberation. But I think that like, yesterday, I could feel, even though I responded a certain way, I could definitely feel like when I was walking in Joaquin Miller and this, um, this this father and his son, and his son was really afraid. Like I was walking out, I'm not hairs out, I'm like running, I'm like having fun, I'm natural and running. I'm like, whatever, I'm doing. And then so, it was, it was, I became very sensitive to it. I was actually just got to be meditating up there, like half an hour was sitting still. So I came down, and I could just really feel like this kid was like trying to walk behind the sun, and he was like hiding, and he's looking at his pops, it's okay, and the son then father was looking up, and it was a lot of energy mm -hmm. just to deal with me on a pathway. <laughs> and I just felt, and then, so me, it was like a compassionate moment, it was like, but I did feel like a dude, like that's fucked up, like yeah. you teaching your, because energetically mm -hmm. I'm thinking like, he's teaching his son a certain way to be around his people in general, and that's limiting him and living in the possible futures for the whole entire planet mm -hmm. in this one little moment. So I was like, wow, like, take care of your business, like, type of vibe. But then it's like, part of me also, that was like something that was inside of me in terms of that love. But then I was thinking about when I actually came close to him, I had a choice on what I was actually going to say, mm -hmm. what I was going to do with it. And I was like, yo, how was your day, yada, yada. And then sort of, I had to be like that bigger individual, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Versus like yeah. going down to this sort of like, like mute, like true vibrational point mm -hmm. level and then actually like creating this, this murkiness in the field in which there the lost opportunity has happened. So I'm just listening for where's the opportunities that, I mean, it happens all the time, it happens right now, it happens in some rooms, like, you know, it always happens, right? You know, how can we lift up those opportunities and create more of that transparency and also like the, that compassion, that feel the compassion? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ashel. Um, what you just said just reminded me just really fast that we're, did you know, you speak right after, um, is, when people are saying things that are like clearly, or not even clearly, but subtly racist, and you can tell that, or sexist, and other people are feeling hurt, um, that's part of the reason, that's where really community comes in, right? So if we create a culture of inclusion, and have, all, and have these discussions, and I hear, for example, somebody saying something to my friend, just, and, and I can tell that they're feeling like, well, that would, you know, that, that clearly made them feel less of, mm -hmm. um, that's where your allies, like, step in and say something. Not, not just, not that you yourself can't say something, mm -hmm. but just having a community behind you and creating that culture of, like, no, we don't accept that here mm -hmm. is extremely important. Mm -hmm. um, in and a all compassionate way. Yeah, and yeah, doing it in a compassionate way. That, that, yeah. Shell's point is so yeah. important. Yeah, that, that is really important. And actually what that reminded me of is like, um, it's not that we're trying to exclude those people and, and from, from being here just because they said something. Our goal should always be like, to integrate everybody's perspective and to focus on inclusion. Like, mm -hmm. come from a place of compassion. Like, I understand that you said that. We don't accept that here, but um, we can move on in a, you know, in a positive fashion. Jude? I got something to say, uh, that is really based on um, this mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of times when it comes across as a good nature friendliness, can be, you know, you know, the situation can be really a form of uh, violence or discrimination. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like one example is, in this country people used to call uh, black people uh, 
but a guy doesn't matter what's your age, boy, right? It's, yeah. it's the way they address a black person, come here, boy, you know, like 60 years old, and the other person, they, like, they, they call you a boy, right? Yeah. And so, I'll give you an example. I was in uh, Hawaii, I was a volunteer on a farm, and the farmer told me to work is a neighbor who is a white person of uh, probably around 50. And uh, so I told him my name. And uh, he didn't like to come my name. So he said, I'll just call you a boy. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So I said, no, I will not call me boy. for the animal rights movement is that minorities are not only underrepresented as participants in this movement, they're, but they're dramatically overrepresented as targets in our movement. Um, some of the most famous campaigns in popular culture are campaigns against whaling, the dolphin slaughter, dog and cock fighting, um, and dog meat. And all of these are practices that are not emblematic of white America or just America's mainstream, but of particular cultural immigrant mm -hmm. or even foreign country practices that that white people don't engage in, and I think that's one of the reasons that these are these practices are targeted. So, for example, you know, like obviously I did not support what Michael Vick did, but I thought the reaction to Michael Vick and the people saying he should be boiled alive and crucified oh and was just a little bit astonishing, given that mm -hmm. most of the white people, in fact, probably most of the white people even standing here at this protest, probably support and engage in similar practices that because they're emblematic of white America, farming being the most mm -hmm. obvious one are not subject to the same sort of hate and vengeance. Um, and I mean, sure, all these particular individuals are well-meaning, but again, I mean, you see every single person here is a white face, and they're attacking a practice that is, 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 is more common in, in Latino or African American or South American communities than, than in white America. Um, so this is the famous singer, who I'm actually a big fan of, Morrissey. Um, he has a great album called Meet His Murder. He's the front man of the Smiths. Um, and a lot of people in the animal rights movement think he's a fantastic guy. In many ways, he is. He's been a very vocal advocate for the animals. Um, but as a Chinese person who is constantly seeing bombard, being bombarded with Facebook images and, and stories and articles about supposedly horrible things that are happening in China, mm -hmm. it's really difficult for me to read something like that. Um, and yeah, it was in The Guardian. So. He said, did you see the thing on the news about the treatment of animals and animal welfare? Absolutely perfect. You can't help but feel that the Chinese are a subspecies. Um, and I think the reason animal rights activists tend to use foreign practices and practices like dog fighting and dog meat or dolphin slaughter is because they feel like it's low-hanging fruit. It's yeah. easiest for us to win these victories because you know, this is already like a marginalized target. This is like some yeah. foreigner. It's, it's a group within the United States that's already disempowered to mobilize our base, you know, white America, because again, 97 plus percent of animal rights activists in the current movement are white. It's much easier for us to target them than for us to target us. Um, but it's a very problematic way of approaching these problems. And here's another example, and I won't read this entire quote. And this is, again, someone I admire immensely. I think he's doing a lot of great activism for, for animals. But Paul Watson penned an article recently called Japanese psychopathic serial killers begin another season of unrestricted slaughter. Um, and he talks about how a normal, sane person could never stab or spear a dolphin. 
I keep hearing critics say that we must wait for the Japanese people to step up and voice our opposition. It's not going to happen. And when you have that sort of mentality, when you're immediately dismissing an entire race of people yeah. as psychopathic serial killers, when you're already expressing as an activist, I have no desire to dialogue, much less change these people, it's a really problematic way of approaching the problem. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I don't think this is because Paul Watson or Morris are necessarily bad people. I think there's legitimate outrage about a lot of these practices, but I think culturally our movement has not raised these issues enough and doesn't I mean, I think, for example, Paul probably would not be saying these sorts of things if one of the people on Sea Shepherd was actually Japanese themselves. Yeah. Just because he'd realize that, oh, you know, like, I have a Japanese ally. I mean, this is my friend. I'm not going to say they're all serial killers. I mean, he's out here fighting for the whales. He Go ahead, actually does have a person that is Japanese, and they're, they're not Japanese. They're 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 Japanese. Yeah, I haven't heard of that recently, yeah, but I think Sea Shepherd just, just like, yeah. I just felt that um, that their translator yeah. got glossed over, yeah. and we're oh. speaking of inclusion. Yeah. And mm. also, not only she, I noticed that she has a, a slight speech impediment. Mm. I'm acutely aware of that. because I had severe speech issues due to neglected ear infection. I was in a horrible situation. Um, talk about being discriminated against. Um, and I've seen black behaviors you've done, but a lot of people, I was, and I'm a public person, I refuse to identify myself as Lily White. I identify myself as multiracial because I have Native American or something. The problem is I just can't prove it because I don't know who my birth father is. Mm -hmm. And but I've also been discriminated because of being having speech impediment here and learning disabilities along with emotional trauma from being a survivor of child abuse. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I've been a survivor of all that. In fact, I worked very openly to try to include members of the disabled. Mm -hmm. And that's vital. And I think, I mean, I think that would be a wonderful step. And I think, I mean, all of these groups, including Morrissey probably, have, have probably acknowledged in some way some of the things they're doing could be improved. And I think, and I hope groups like Sea Shepherd do the same thing, right? That they're trying to integrate these perspectives and integrate these people into their activism. So even if only from the perspective of effectiveness, I don't think they're going to be do, doing a very good job of changing Japan if they don't get any buy-in from Japanese people. Yeah. Um, so, on the topic of there is only like one Japanese person on the ship, I think that when we're talking about diversity, um, that we have to, and, and how to encourage that and foster that, I think that we also have to be incredibly conscious of avoiding um, tokenism, mm -hmm. which yeah. is when there's like one, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because at that point you're you're not really diversifying the, the movement, you're not taking input, you're, you're not respecting them. Mm -hmm. um, what you're doing is you're just putting on the kind of makeup and it, um, it, it ends up uh, perpetuating the same kind of violence that you're trying to, is it glossed, who was saying it glossed over it? Yeah, we have Someone over here. Oh, oh, I used that when that one time Japanese person I mentioned, I felt glossed over that person. Yeah. And I wanted to include them. And I can understand you know, And I don't sit from a, a token perspective. Yeah, because, I mean, when they did the translation, I heard some of, I could hear some of the horrible words that the Japanese, Japanese whaler, we were referring to the mink whales. And, that I thought, and they were being attacked. I'm a rural animal lover too. In fact, I thought that at times animals were my only friend. So any attack on them, I'd see it as an attack against me, even though I'm not directly attacked. It's just mm -hmm. how I see yeah. it. Yeah. I think a lot of us come from that same place, mm -hmm. particularly if we felt marginalized or attacked, mm -hmm. violated physically or otherwise. Yeah. The thing about Morrissey is that he has a history of like saying bigoted things. Yeah. Like he he said things about immigrants, so he's like very xenophobic as well. So I think it's important to recognize that it's not just a one-off. Mm -hmm. And with Paul Watson, he 
he also, um, I had a friend that volunteered with, with Sea Shepherd, and he was fine with like no Nazis like participating on the Sea Shepherd because their their aim was to work against whaling. So he didn't care that they held bigoted ideals. Yeah. Yeah, it's difficult. I mean, I we'll, we'll talk about we'll have some suggested yeah. ideas for trying to deal with these sorts of situations where you feel like someone has said or even done something physically that that's you know harmful and prejudicial, maybe even violent, um, whether in a verbal way or in a physical way. But well, we'd certainly entertain other perspectives on these things. And I, I think the most important thing is that they need to be acknowledged and discussed. There has to be respectful communication. Um, so, yeah. But, um, so again, and, and it's not just these prominent voices that are saying things. Every time you see kind of a campaign or a protest or even a Facebook photo, these comments were all drawn from recent Facebook um, photos of either Chinese or Japanese slaughter of marine animals or dogs and cats. And again, marine animals and dogs and cats within white culture are privileged and considered the important animals, while pigs, cows, and chickens and all the other animals that we abuse. And we abuse these at far higher rates than any of the country. So mm -hmm. again, if you're concerned about animal abuse, the U.S. is factually the number one contributor to animal abuse, right? Because yeah. in China, for example, per capita meat consumption is maybe 60 to 70 pounds. In the United States, it's close to 200. And just so the scale is just not proportionate. In India, it's even lower. It's like 30, 30 pounds. Um, but every time you see, you know, an incident like Taiji tai, tai or the dog and cat slaughter in China, you see comments like this all over Facebook, and usually they're not even really checked. So things like they need another tsunami, motherfuckers. What is wrong with Asian people? God help Asian and their ignorance. It's difficult to not want violence against these horrible people. And this is a recent one that Chris just found and pointed out to me, unfortunately. Um, in response to like the beating of a dog in a Chinese village. And again, these are like rural people who probably are not very well educated, haven't thought about these issues, have a long history of violence against animals, don't have the same privileges and opportunities that we have, um, don't have a community that's even giving them the idea that animals are, are beings that ought to be respected, and yet the response of so many people is things like, I think China should be wiped off the planet, nothing is safe while they live. <coughs> very difficult. Chris? <coughs> Well, one thing uh, you know, worthy about that last quote like that I found is there were a lot of comments afterwards and no one was denigrating that person for saying that. People were like, some people were saying, oh, maybe you shouldn't say that. And, <laughs> maybe you should uh, say that. <laughs> other people were saying, like, I feel really... It's going to ruin our plan, right? I feel <laughs> other people were like, I'm sympathetic to your view, but... We should not be saying that. Like, but but then there were other people who were kind of like had the same sentiment, uh -huh. and I was just like, how can? And this was the the site that it was on was like I feel like it was maybe even a Chinese run site, and so like was a pro kind of a pro Chinese like animal rights mm -hmm. animal welfare site, but then um, like maybe just wasn't uh, what do you call it? monitored very well or whatever. But a lot of the people on this site. It's just, I was just like, that's unbelievable. It was just unbelievable to me. That and this is like recent. Mm -hmm. I don't really pay much. I don't pay as much attention to like um, these medias. I don't go searching, but um, I remember just hearing about like the recent Winter Games and how like in Russia they were just killing all the stray animals. And honestly, just as you know, a society, I don't think that Russia, like the Russians, just as a culture, as a people, would be with this kind of hatred, like and, and just acknowledging. That consciousness, like when people of European or European descent, they like all oh, they look down on it. And people of color do it, but oh, we gotta exterminate them. Yeah. You so know, there, there actually were uh, there was quite an outcry about Russians, and mm -hmm. um, but it was always sort of skewed in that way to make them other. And the same thing. What was it like? We'll kill them all. Um, I I tended to avoid. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't I don't remember exactly. That's probably that's probably not. not. No, I understand. I, 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 I see the outcry. I've noticed that. Yeah. Like, yeah, the Russians are just doing this. And, but then it wasn't about a whole people. Yeah, 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 like maybe not. Yeah. Putin yeah. was doing this. It was a yeah. political thing. This is just basically. No, 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 no. I know. Kill but all, I think, kill I think, I think there was a bit of that. But, but and also. There's just, just one point. I think in the the, the outcry of Sochi, there is also acknowledgement of the fact that there are Russians who are working against us themselves. Exactly. Yeah. And we worked exactly. with some of these Russians. That's it wasn't it was the Russian well. people. It was like the Russian government or their particular yeah. practices exactly. and within this particular mm -hmm. country that are bad. Not let's wipe out the entire country. It's right. stereotyped right. from right. one interaction we saw of one camera. To, I mean, there are more Chinese people than there are any other ethnicity in the world to identify all Chinese as by one person's bad act against one dog is and it's really problematic. Right? So we need to make these yeah. distinctions to, to say, yes, it's the fight continues, the, the fight continues, you know, civil rights is more, let's acknowledge that these people are human. Yeah. Okay.
Okay, let's not acknowledge that there is no otherness. That's like the best thing. We've been fighting that for who knows how long as a people struggle for that. And that's, that's, I mean, that's just kind of why I brought that up. So this is actually an image from, from India, um, just showing that activists all over the world, and I think this is actually, uh, I mean, there's a lot of race dynamics in all countries. The point is yeah. that there, there are these activist movements rising up in all these countries, and so say, say you're against racism. I mean, you can't just immediately condemn an entire race of people as being racist just because you see one, one person from that particular community being racist. racist. And I say this, and that's obviously true when it comes to racism. I think the same has to be true of species. Mm -hmm. We say one particular individual who happens to be of a particular race doing some bad act, that doesn't mean we can condemn that entire race of people, much less say they should be wiped off the face of the planet. Mm -hmm. um, oh, so one question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, I had another experience. Like every summer, I worked at Alameda County Fair, and I had a little boy with his parents, and he just spoke beautiful English, and he could pronounce polite. And he came up and he said, somebody said such, something, and he goes, and I said, somebody who was not as well educated, you know, your parents did a good job with you. You know, somebody who chose not to be educated about how to treat other people said about, and that's not your fault, and thank you for telling me, and I will pass that message on to that, that person, and I will have my boss do that. And he said the name, and I said that was a very disrespect. He is, and he does, and I see it as a disrespect to you. And that is not the why factor in the fair. We're all supposed to play nicely at the fair. Yeah. And when he said that, I mean, he was almost in tears, this little guy. And then when after I said that, I put the biggest um, smile on him, and I turned and reported it to my my boss and he says, we need to educate some of these people. And I'm and I said, not all these people who are who do the right, you call them the right jock, that's their term for it. And the people that do the game we call those those folks are just as carnival workers or carnies or whatever you want to call it. I said, yeah, not all kinds are like that. And, yes. and I have a couple of friends. And if you're in that area and you hear someone tell them, my friends, I mean, we can say, hey, you know, we don't accept that here. Yeah. That's not nice. You know? That's not true. And so, and then I put the biggest cloud in but hey, tell my friend who runs the mirror, you know, <coughs> Esther said you, you know, because I know some of the people. Yeah. Nice. And also, this year and next year, or my last two years, I'm going to be working for it because I'm going to retire. Okay. Next year. Hopefully, we'll see you more here. We'd love to have you. Wait, before we move on, can I just say something about? Sure. Okay, so um, uh, we were just talking about like these specific single issue campaigns, and I think it's important <coughs> to point out like when people say when people uh, use stories of, for example, uh, someone beating a dog to death in China, um, how like racism perpetuates speciesism and vice versa. It's I mean, it, it's uh, it's so infective because if you think about the fact that like we're saying boycott China and boycott Japan yeah, yeah. because they're doing these specific acts mm -hmm. against these specific animals, not only is it racist but it's also speciesist, which is you know against your own position. You're basically saying that um, we don't here boycott America because we sell you know we have Whole Foods and Chipotle and you know you don't see that anywhere else in the world. Where people people are talking about humane meat. To the extent where we are talking about over here, of course, people are countries are following because they see that um, it's happening in the USA. But you don't hear that like boycott America. So yeah, the fact, hunting. right? So yeah. yeah. So the fact that like that exists is so species. It's basically saying like cows, pigs, cows, pigs, and chickens not as important as dogs and cats. And, and dogs and cats are the animals being killed in countries like Japan or China and um, Korea. So. Um, and just, just thinking about something else, just you know, regarding just how racism is kind of prevalent, just among you know, countries and like internationally, how um, you know, when that woman was raped in India, how they just kind of like framed it in a way. And, it, and I'm good, it's good that it was exposed, but it became framed in a way that, like, in my mind, was processes you Indians are rapists, mm -hmm. and it's just a part of their culture. 
it doesn't talk about you know rape as a, as a society of male issue as a, like a, like a male issue or males perpetuating violence against women. It seems like let's look at India, let's distract everybody because this is what's happening. It's like you know, so if people have these notions in their mind that this is what this is about. So it's, it's excuse to be yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Africa has their own like legacy. We should keep going on all the different things that people get scapegoated on. Mm -hmm. But it's just like these things that are racing. Like we don't necessarily think right away consciously. That what is this, what are they really trying to say? What's, really being, what's the real message here? Yep. So that, that leads to the question, one question that we're going to ask as a group, and we don't necessarily have an answer to this question, but should we have campaigns that focus on minority practices at all? Um, and I think there are good reasons to think about whether these campaigns should exist at all. Um, the first is just ethical. Are they exploiting the same racist psychology that is, we described at the beginning of the talk? Right, the identification of the other, the suppression of empathy, um, the activation or triggering of some sort of active hostility, animosity, or even violence. If we're exploiting the same mechanism that we're trying to destroy in speciesism, that seems ethically problematic. But secondly, are they strategic? I mean, typically, most of these practices are of limited breadth and scale, as I've already noted. I mean, if you're going to compare China and the United States, for example, the United States is still by far the biggest animal killer and animal abuser in the world. Mm -hmm. So targeting practice in China is just not as big in terms of scale. I mean, um, but there's also a limited ability to serve as a gateway issue for the reason that, that Priya identified, which is that you know, to the extent that you think you need to trigger people's consciousness with an issue where they're already sort of on board and move on to something bigger, if you're targeting a practice that's foreign because it's foreign, mm -hmm. then it's easy for people to dismiss it and say like, oh, this is a problem that the Chinese have, this is a problem that the Japanese have, this is a problem that African American communities have. It's not a problem that me as like a good progressive Whole Foods customer who buys human meat should be concerned about. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we need to reverse that dynamic and say, like, no, actually, it's, it's the whole food customers of the world who are actually causing bigger problems for animals and for racial minorities, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to reverse that power dynamic. So um, there's also just the fact of optics. I mean, as, as someone who's done a lot of press work over the years, like the optics of a movement attacking um, a marginalized group, it might seem powerful in the short run and might make you feel like, oh, we've got so much support for this because we're targeting Chinese people, we're targeting African Americans, mm -hmm. we're targeting Mexicans. But in the long run, the optics of that are not useful for building and sustaining a movement. Because again, people can dismiss it. And in the long run, the allies you really want to have, the people who are dedicated to social justice, will see what you're doing, see that you're exploiting the fact that you have power over this subgroup, whether it's immigrants, Chinese people, black people, and they'll realize, oh, this is not something I'm going to be a part of. I don't want to be a part of bullying. I don't want to be a part of a power structure that's using its power in an exploitative way to marginalize and hurt a group that's weaker. Um, and strategically, I think that's not a very good, good idea. And then finally, are these campaigns winnable? Um, and you know, I, as I've already emphasized and as we've discussed, there's an extensive literature about how the fact that if you want to change some practice, you really have to get local community buy-in. And if we're targeting minorities and denigrating them as monsters and violent people, the likelihood that we're actually going to be able to win these campaigns is very low. So, you know, the anti-whaling campaigns against the Japanese have been happening for decades. We haven't had a lot of success, and the Japanese seem just as insistent on killing whales as they did 30 years ago. Part of that might be they haven't made as much of an effort as they could to integrate Japanese people into those mm -hmm. campaigns. Instead, mm -hmm. they've said things like Japanese or psychopathic serial killers. Mm -hmm. that's, that's not a very useful strategy for winning the campaign, if you want to. <laughs> So notwithstanding this, I think there, there probably are some instances where we can campaign against practices. And certainly, for example, I mean, our focus is direct action everywhere is anti-speciesism, and speciesism is something that exists in all, mm -hmm. in all minority groups, whether you're white or black, yellow or brown, I mean, mm -hmm. it exists everywhere, and racism does too. So we're not saying that we can't target any practice that minorities engage in. I mean, it, it's not the fact that, the fact that I'm Chinese does not give me free license to do whatever I want to animals, for example. I mean, it doesn't give me the right to feel entitled to not face any sort of criticism or discussion if I do something that's bad to animals. But the key thing is, I think, first principle is we shouldn't demon us. Um, we shouldn't say that you're bad because you're Chinese, you're bad because you're Mexican, you're bad because you're black. We should say and clarify that traditional American and white practices are often just as bad. And while we might talk about an example that's drawn from the Chinese community, we're not trying to target Chinese people, we're just saying this is an example of something that white America is doing to an even greater extent. And one, one example of this strategy is Animal Quality, this really great Spanish group, did have a dog meat campaign that um, focused on Chinese practices, um, and there were some problems with it, and I felt like they could have done a little bit of a better job of integrating Chinese voices in that campaign, but one thing they actually did not do was say this is bad because it's a foreign practice. They made clear that we're doing this campaign because we want to say this is exactly the same as what we're doing in Spain. Right? We're doing it to far more animals, animals that are just as sensitive. So we're illustrating, we're using these dogs because we're trying to evoke these emotions in you as people who have interacted with dogs, who love dogs, to show that the entire system is problematic in ways that you probably don't even have choice of. Yeah. 
And I think that's, that's the right approach we have to take if we're going to be targeting minority, um, minority communities. Second is get buy-in, and we've emphasized this throughout this presentation. If you're going to try and change a practice, you need to get buy-in from the community who's engaged in that practice. So um, we should engage and seek engagement and even active criticism from activists within the community and, and not just rest on our laurels and assume that we know how to change this culture. We should affirmatively seek it out when we're, when we're targeting a community or when we're focused on a community that we don't necessarily understand. And then finally, and this is drawn from, I mean, uh, Google has a lot of problems and I'm fully supportive of the anti-Google protests, but I do think their corporate motto is useful for this purpose, don't be evil. So if you see something happening that you think is prejudicial or harmful, then talk about it. Correct that racism, correct, correct it as it bubbles up, when it bubbles up. And I think you can do it in a compassionate way and in an authentic way, mm -hmm. um, in a way that isn't angry and hateful, um, but it does have to be done. And I think the problem in the animal rights movement is, is too often that everyone feels like, oh, you know, we're all part of the same community, which is true, but good communities have transparency. They're just like good relationships, right? If you have a good relationship with someone, you don't just like stay quiet when you're feeling upset about something. You have to have a process where people can engage with each other. And one of the things we've emphasized in Direct Action Everywhere is, at any point, if any of you have any reservations, tactically, strategically, or ethically about any of the practices, especially of kind of the key organizers, you know, we want to have a dialogue with you, and I think that's a really important part of developing a strong community and activist network. So let's just briefly summarize what we talked about today. The first is, the first bullet point of the presentation is that speciesism and racism have really important parallels, and that noting the similarities between these different forms of oppression can be very powerful for both of those movements. And the second point is that notwithstanding the fact that speciesism and racism are so similar and that there should be alliances built between these movements, minorities are hugely unrepresented in this movement, again by a factor of 12. Um, so it makes sense for us to make a special effort to acknowledge the fact that there probably are some often subconscious, as, as J JC, right? JC has been mentioning, a lot of these processes are subconscious biases that allow us to exclude minorities. We need to overcome those by affirmatively trying to seek out minority voices. And finally, we should definitely acknowledge and note that minorities, for whatever reason, whether it's active racism or something more subconscious, are overrepresented as targets for a movement. So we should always question whether a campaign against a minority community is really worth pursuing. If we decide it should be pursued, we should always you know, keep in mind the model. Don't be evil. So with that, I'm going to let Priyanka go over again to facilitate a conversation. Um, and thank you all for listening. And the, the slides will be posted later. <laughs> share stories or, you know, even ideas or suggestions of how to be more inclusive um, and, most importantly, your experiences. So, don't all speak at once. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin. Uh, mine is maybe just more about the presentation, like the, the usage of the word minority yes. in particular is problematic. Yeah. Like, I think, especially since we're talking globally yeah. as well, like, people of color are the majority, sure. you know, yeah. so, so that's, that's just yep. one point that I have. Okay. Yeah, point well taken, and it's a good point. And I, I mean, I, I said that myself, like, people mm -hmm. of color are the majority, yeah. you know, so, but, yeah. but we're accepting that framing and we use it. Like, exactly. so it's a good correction. Mm -hmm. Oh, somebody raised their hand. Okay. So just a real quick thing is, um, oh, what's that word? Amnesty. So like, if people have an idea that they want to share, but they're maybe not sure that it's a really good idea, like, this should be a learning space, especially, you know, for community meetings, especially, where, you know, you can say something and then feel free to get corrected or feel free to, like, have a discussion about it. And, and like, um, we are all, everyone here, we're all here to learn and we're all here to to, to also to teach, you know, so some of us, uh, and we, you know, if you, if we say something, like, try not to hold it against, mm -hmm. you know, anyone who says something that, like, maybe uh, we find offensive, but try to, you know, maybe help them to learn why mm -hmm. uh, we're offended, someone could be offended by something they said, or whatever. Or take um, I, I just want to emphasize or just expound upon the last point about, like, campaigning against like other people from people of color, what have you, other groups, um, particularly for the topic. I think um, we should think campaign form, um, and what I mean by that is um, we need to find out and we need to really address the, the roots of the practice, like the cultural roots of the practice. For example, um, you know, people from like, you know, the African American community, um, like we're heavy in eating pork, but people don't really realize like the history of that, you know, that, that wasn't the practice. You know, in the homeland where these people come from, but as a legacy of 
slavery and genocide, and um, people not having as many um, options and being forced to eat whatever they can, um, has been ingrained over generations and over generations. It's really about helping them to like educate them, helping them to unlearn and see how they're invested in that they are now, and that they are being afflicted in very insidious ways that they're not aware of, and how they're being used in that way. And um, this is just one example. It's like a lot of people. Um, there's a lot. There's people who um, who come from all over, like you know, immigrate from all over. They they come here, and then once you're in the months in America, they kind of um, conform. And, and try to and try to meld in. They give up some of their own practices, which are healthier, and trying to like they start eating burgers and participating in this way of life that's kind of mm -hmm. um, dictated by by this cultural norm. Like this is what you have to do to be an American. Mm -hmm. So it's always about if you're not, if you're not an American, you're other, and if you're other, then you know you're going to end up in prison, brutalized, beaten, exiled. So we need to kind of start to help our own people unlearn, you know, learn these traumas and or these these behavior patterns that are. Um, been dictated through traumas and generations and acknowledge that yes they've done they've, they've taken a tremendous amount of effort into making sure people are where they are and it's not necessarily their fault though you know we can still hold people accountable we need to make sure we appeal to them, give them that chance and reach out to them that in the best way we can that way josh do you um on the on the distinction that you made um of the kind of scarcity of races how they uh, conform to kind of an American way of life after they come here. Um, I think that is very important to kind of dissociate nationalism from racism. Yeah. Um, and uh, particularly in the context of being inclusive, like I know that DXC is international, right? Yeah, we have campaigns that reach have reached 17 different countries around the country. Yeah. We don't have a chapter internationally right now, but oh, it's certainly okay. an international network. Well, in 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 the um, in the spirit of talking about a new chapter, um, I, I was talking with this young woman once. Um, she was first generation American. Her family was from Kenya, and she was saying how when she went back to Kenya, she was born and raised here. When she went back, because of her accent and like the way that she acted, and this touch of oh, I think she left, but on the like socio kind of side of race, um, they called her white. And she was, and, you know, one of the darkest people that I had ever seen. And um, so, if 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 DXC is going to expand in that in that kind of international that international stage, then this conversation has to be replicated every step of the way. Because while we're talking about you know the Tip O'Neill quote, um, it really is these things are very ingrained in um, local communities and just talk about it here and then to expand upon that, I think would be detrimental. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. Adrian. Hey. Um, hi, I'm Adrian. I'm being late. Sorry for being late. Um, but I've really enjoyed this conversation so far. And there's a couple things that I wanted to bring up, and it kind of touches on a lot of what everyone was talking about. Um, a good friend of mine, we actually just kind of had a, a little a little bit of an argument. She posted this article on Facebook. It was talking about the history of where the stereotype of um, African Americans liking fried chicken. And I read it, and I had heard about um, such things before. And, and her and I are close, and so I said, you know, I, I think it's, you know, it's pretty sad and unprogressive. This is still happening. And I said, however, wouldn't it be nice to, if or when everybody, anybody ever stereotyped you, you could say, well, no, actually, I don't eat fried chicken because I'm vegan. And she didn't think it was as funny as I did. But um, I definitely see the, the, par the exact parallels of speciesism and racism. And I absolutely believe that veganism is the moral baseline, that if we can consider these animals that are considered lower and less than us as having moral value, then we will accept and um, see everybody as being the same. And um, me being, I'm German and Mexican, and I think that I look brown enough and white enough to people speak really candidly to me. So I've kind of, I hear both sides and I hear racism on all sides. And I feel like a lot of people of color feel like they want to stay very, we want to stay very close to our culture and tradition, and I know that we hear that in all cultures and all ethnicities. Um, and a lot of people of color don't want to feel like they're 
assimilate, assimilating mm -hmm. more than they already have, and they're being stripped away of more of their, their culture. So I'm trying to like figure out how I can speak to people and let them know that it's all one and the same. And that if we give up those ideas, then mm -hmm. everything will kind of all fall into line. So I don't know, I just kind of feel like, you know, it's touchy because people are very close to their culture, as, as am I. Um, but I try to let them know, like, I grew up the same way, and I, you know, I grew up eating carnitas and, you know, all these traditional Mexican foods, and now I just have, I still have those traditions, I've just tweaked it a little bit now that my thought process is, a little, is diff way different. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm very happy that we're talking about this today, and I'm getting a lot of good um, perspective and ideas, so. Thanks, Adrian. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I was on. Um, I was. I do a lot of, um, a lot of different things, but I just wanted to share. Uh, I'm actually organizing next Saturday in uh, Salinas. I do a lot of work on lots of climate education. Salinas. What's that? You said Salinas. Salinas, California. And um, I work. I also work with Lauren a bunch of food and farming projects. And she has a uh, vegan, vegan Mexican persona. If you're familiar with Lauren, the food and farming project. Oh yes. Vegan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we work. You know, close to stuff. Anyways. I can send an email. I was actually going to stop by and get flyers before I came up here. But I just wanted to share that we're actually organizing a farm, planning for the farm, the first Farm Work Appreciation Day, Central Coast, in Salinas, uh, organized by the, the young folks uh, at the Alice High, North Salinas High School, and different high schools, everyone else, other high schools down there, uh, Gonzalez, things like that. And I could actually, I'm, I could send out an email about it. But essentially, what we're doing is linking the connection between food, climate, and health. And then, so the conversation on veganism. Is, is like sort of in that space a lot of times, um, but not necessarily, I'm not, I'm not, not necessarily talking about sort of veganism in that space too, just because I'm, a, I'm an organizer and I, I really like, I sort of always always edge things in terms of what they're communicating. Um, and so like the issue definitely is health a lot of times, and then sort of sure that's like the bromide issue, there's things with pesticides, et cetera, but it's also like economic empowerment. So, I'm also sharing this to share like sort of just how I how I organize and how it's actually becoming really, really powerful because it's so open. It's like super open. Well, I could have said like, you know, we I organized a meeting for like people to go vegan. It probably been a less like population of people showing up. <laughs> that what we're doing now is sort of just saying like farm work appreciation and the way we got to that was really around um, looking at spent like asking the question, what are the assets in the community? What are the um, Obviously, I had a Rosa Gonzalez and I had a Chago. I was, I was just going and sort of parachuting in the community, like trying to organize and whatever. But, like, what are assets of the community? And what people were saying was that lots of lot of amazing assets and some of the issues are that there's a lot of bullying in our schools, right? This is how it all started. So, we didn't go in talking about like the fact that, like, you know, animal agriculture is responsible for, like, and, you know, the most greenhouse gases, et cetera, et cetera. We, we could have attacked we, we educated people about that, let them know about that. But so they could know, but they were like, yeah, the Spanish-speaking people in our school, and the people who don't, there's a lot of bullying between these two groups in the school. So it's like, wow, let's unpack that. So after we unpack that some more, what we started realizing that there was like sort of this internalized sort of like oppression, um, and it's almost like shame that people had based on the, 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 the culture and the descendants, and wow, like, you know, though my parent, my then my uncle, then my grandmother is a farmer. Etc. The everyone looks down upon them, right? So, so the, the Spanish-speaking people that were um, were sort of representing that, and then there was like this turmoil that was coming out in the symptom of this bullying, which was really interesting. So, then um, that's when we start talking about like, what what did gratitude look like? The field of gratitude. What 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 would cure that? And what was the medicine for that? And the medicine was gratitude. And this is what they came up with. So I'm just like, just from doing a bunch of organizing around, almost like um, almost like spiritual activism, we see more like, just like a lot of potency in that when we can actually frame that and actually speak from that space. Um, and it actually eliminates, because it's a higher vibration, so it eliminates a lot of like confusion. So then when, in that space though, boom, it was like farmer appreciation that came out like the next second. Underneath that, you could have all these platforms around anything you wanted to talk about. like. You know, the drought causing economic disparities, he's like, yada yada. It was really powerful. Um, so anyways, I just wanted to make sure that like, people knew about that. You want to come down, check it out. The people organizing around that. And it's going to be one in June. 
and hopefully it becomes an annual thing. Um, one thing I also wanted to share, just um, just from my experience around, the reason why I got into the movement um, in general, is that I mean, my grandfather was a, a minister in the Baptist church, I grew up in Chicago actually, so like little you know, town and um, but I ended up coming, um, I actually did, interesting enough, I ended up studying this, uh, this Dallas alchemy, I went to, I went to school um, for like uh, transpersonal psychology and spiritual psychology. Cool. So I um, ended up studying with T and Gong. Um, and it was really sort of like an esoteric practice. And I also studied shamanism, and so I studied like an approach to shamanism. And, um, it sort of just sometimes end up in a space. So it was interesting to see these like underlying dynamics mm-hmm. of things that we were talking about in the political sphere that I was really so politically motivated and really like, you know, in a certain space around that, but then it sort of lost a lot of energy and it started really um, looking at well, what's the root of things. And it became really fascinating um, to see that, um, you know, certain, the re- like for example, like relationship, the contracts, they're actually literally seeing in talking to an, like animal spirits and deities. And I'm and I saying this to actually normalize sort of these experiences more so that, you know, everyone can go into their own indigenous like background we all mm-hmm. have and actually sort of investigate these things on their own, like the basis of all spiritual religious experiences, really the mystical experiences that people have individually, you know. But again, also I don't want to say anything like, yeah, no, there's atheists and movies like that. Um, but this is like my direct experience. So like, um, the, there was this interesting thing where like the, the cow, like we communicated with the, and this was replicated by people around the room having the same experience too. Um, because I was, you know, I wasn't really eating food actually at the time. So then, yeah, a lot of, I just about diet actually went out the window a little bit too. Because I was actually just really receiving energy, universal energy, to be, be frank, you need to keep a rope shoot. Just because of the practices we were using, doing. But um, the, 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 the cows were, it was just this trade off between like the, the mad cow disease. Um, and sure, we can look at it from a scientific level and look at it, oh, this is what happened with the E. coli, da 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 da. Really, but there was, there was this. This, predis- this pre- something happened before it actually came to that point where that was a, just like a disrespect, a, like a violent disrespect, a violation of many to these animal sort of beings, spirits, mm-hmm. that the trade off, the balance had to ensue because in the universe there is that. There's that balance, and so the balance became, you know, well, there's these diseases that we give to your population, same with the flu, bird flu virus, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so I started seeing this along the lines of like, and then I started looking deeper at like, just different cities and the violence, Oakland. Like I started actually having these dialogues on that in this space, and um, just wanted to get more people to actually ex- get to that point of actually experiencing those experiences, so we can actually push the needle a little bit quicker. Because I was like really looking at how wow we were actually like uh, negotiating on behalf of like the humanity essentially to keep it real. In this, in these spaces that that were really um, just like really sensitive spaces around like you know how human humanity's relationship with different animals and humanity's relationship with themselves, and you got you got really deep. But I just say that so they make it have that vibration and frequency of like yeah that, that that silence you can get into to actually communicate directly and then actually alleviate karma karmic energies. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Apple. And then um, we'd love to find out more about the um, events that you shared. So, um, at, before um, Kelly, I just wanted to say that after the discussion, we're also going to go through our organizing principles and talk about direct action every year. But let's continue the discussion. Kelly? Um, Glenn, one of our activists in Chicago, is asking, to what extent might making comparisons between racism, racism and speciesism risk alienating people of color? Since in our current speciesist paradigm, efforts to elevate the status of non-humans through comparison to humans can often be interpreted as denigrating to those humans. Okay. That's um, a good question. That's a really hard question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really good. Very glad. And I'm not sure this, there's a good answer to it. If I can say, I mean, in my 15 years of activism, I've, <laughs> I've done some things I regret and some things that I think work fairly well. I think direct comparisons without any sort of context, and especially if they're negative, mm-hmm. um, tend to be very poorly received and are probably unethical too. So I, just as one example of a thing that I think is a mistake. I, for a while I was at the University of Chicago holding signs that had the words racism equals sexism and speciesism and on 
it wasn't the same as the, the image that we have here, which is like a more positive, kind of just affirmative identity affirming message. It was violence images of like people have been racially violated in some way. I think there was like a picture, I think it was a picture of like the rape of Nanjing, like abused Chinese people have been murdered by Japanese people, and like a black slave who had been whipped, and the sexism was the same thing, and speciesism, we had factory farming and other images. And so many people got so angry, and the message of anti-speciesism got so lost in the perceived insensitivity they were expressing towards um, people of color and towards women that we just shut it down. <laughs> because like, all right, this is, this is not effective. So that is an example, if I think, of a comparison that does not work very well at all because it's not respecting the autonomy, the identity um, of this other group that's being marginalized and oppressed. It's just, we're just kind of swooping in and trying to co-opt their experience and steal it for our own purposes. Even me as a Chinese person, I mean, I wouldn't even use like an image of violent, violent, violated Chinese people because those are Chinese people whose experience I don't share either. Mm -hmm. um, so I, my perspective now, at least, in, and I think it's worked fairly little at TXC, is we could certainly use those stories as stories of inspiration. We, could, we should look to the civil rights movement, the farm workers movement, the women's rights movement as, as stories of inspiration of how we can change the world. I mean, we can talk certainly about how the psychological processes of racism and sexism and speciesism and enableism are all very related. Um, but I think even from the perspective of just authenticity, for us to kind of to try and directly co-opt those experiences for our advocacy is really, really problematic. And ineffective too. Not just ethically problematic, but effective. Um, but I'd invite other people's perspectives on this. Kevin. I think you were really on point. I think it also matters like who is putting out that message. Yeah. 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 yeah, so I can certainly talk about, I, I have talked about my experiences as being a Chinese person who's actually faced violence. Mm -hmm. I was beaten up by neo-Nazis and had my face sliced. Mm -hmm. And I can talk about that experience authentically because it's my experience as a Chinese person. And I can, and I can say it because this is true. It's one of the reasons I am rights activist today. Because like, like the, the times when I go craziest are the times when I think about those experiences I went through and I think about an animal, any animal, whether human or non-human animal, going through those same experiences. Like those are nights that keep me up. And, and I like am pulling my hair out and I'm crazy because I just think about how horrible it was for me. And so that that's like an authentic experience that isn't me stealing or co-opting or exploiting someone else's story for some political purpose. It's my story. You know, so I'm entitled to use it. So I think Kevin's absolutely right. Yeah, and I guess just one more point. Go ahead. Because I guess it works in reverse or like how co-optation can also lead to manipulation. Like I mm. see all the time like these, mm. these pseudo MLK quotes circulating on the internet, so I just think mm -hmm. like it just needs to go away, you know, it needs to be, like you were saying. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Kevin. So Josh, Ortega, and then Gene. Okay, uh, touching on that, um, I think that it's, um, not only might it not be effective in terms of building solidarity, but I also think that conflating these movements too closely mm -hmm. is, um, is problematic strategically because it, it, it doesn't, like um, somebody mentioned, was it you who mentioned earlier about the um, the differences between the Jewish Holocaust and mm -hmm. the diaspora and the Native American? Yeah. So all of those things are um, are clearly terrible, but they all have different histories and they all have different reasons for coming about. And so if we're looking to solve these problems, um, we're going to have to go come up with them differently. And so. I don't know how good of an idea it is. Yeah, but even, even them having like um, different histories, it's still the same thing um, with regards to like a, a dis disregard for life. Of course. And yeah. so what I think the step in healing that would be um, to not address the people as perpetrators of violence, mm -hmm. but victims of, of like a of, like of, like of kind of imposed ignorance mm -hmm. and, 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 and miseducation. So yeah. I think it's like for me, yeah, um, like I, you know, and like I come from poverty. I come from like not knowing the next meal is coming from, and a lot of like hard circumstances. Um, I I hold on to what measure of awareness I was born into this world with, which is what kept, got me here to this day. But um, when when I first heard the concept of veganism, when I was like like in my early like twenties or something, I'm just like. This is just like some kind of way, this is my first initial reaction, this is a kind of way for the privileged people mm -hmm. to kind of demonize yeah. poor, poor um, people of color. Yeah. Yeah. Because look, um, okay, we, it, it was, there's all these different degrees, but then that in effect makes I'm a poor person. Mm -hmm. it, I, I didn't even think about like 
not being able to afford to go to college, so I have to face it on that level yet. But then, on the base human level of what I eat to survive, what I eat to live, that's very personal for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And it's not because, um, and, and it's, it's very intimate to the point where, like, if somebody just, like, snatches some food out of my hand, it's a very primal instinct. Yeah. Yeah. And so when people hear you're attacking their diet, they don't necessarily hear that, okay, maybe I'm participating in something on this grand scale. And it's even because of that type of diet, the way it's processed, the way it comes, the slaughter, the suffering, yeah. the energy, on, like, to ask you speak, like, ask you speak, to all these different levels, they kind of block some some measures. In my, in my own personal experience, they block my own measures of empathy. Mm -hmm. I know they have a lot more compassion, empathy, and a lot less aggression towards beings, even beings I really have a little tolerance for, mm -hmm. or people behaviors I have tolerance for, since I've started to kind of practice veganism a lot more in my decisions. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's just, but I wouldn't have come to that de decision overnight had somebody just directly tried to radically overhaul without right. understanding what I'm going through, not mm -hmm. just saying, oh, I hear your struggle, but this. Yeah. This is what you need to work on. I'm yeah. like, I'm trying to meet my base human needs. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you telling me here, here's something else on your plate. You you need to you need to um, bring you know bring bring it bring home the bread and the butter and you need to do this and this. All right, that's cool. You know, stop thinking about yourself and your own survival. Come do this. Yeah. Like uh, first and foremost, we need to make sure people are taken care of in the community. And that's not necessarily saying here here's a handout. Here's this. Here's that. Here's this. If you have if you have resource, if you know if you have you know information, if you just most of the time it's just camaraderie. Yeah. It's just the camaraderie. Yeah. It's on the strength and the love. Of I acknowledge your existence as a person. I acknowledge you not other than me, but also honor you know, what's different about you, the uniqueness in that way. These things go you know, leaps and bounds um, beyond just trying to tell somebody, um, hey, you need to overhaul. And I think they, they are parallel. That's, that's where it is. But I think it's, right now it could be too, it's the way you approach it. And, and it's the way you address it. Because people aren't ready to really fully accept it. I'm still learning to fully accept in my consciousness like what speciesism is and how I participate in that, um, and, and how to undo that. I still, as a man, have still a, a significant way to go, to, you know, with regards to being an ally of women and mm -hmm. um, deprogramming my sexism, mm -hmm. or being a person of color, um, trying to deprogram my traumatic experiences with people who perpetuate racism upon me, not just people of European descent, but people from other different groups of color, and colors on me as well. So, um, but acknowledging. Um, it's, it's in these types of degrees that we have to kind of start to really sit down with ourselves and ask the hard questions and not judge ourselves if we really try and not judge ourselves. A lot of people, I think, are challenged to really address these issues because it, 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 you might see something that you don't like in the mirror. You might reflect upon yourself and it's like, oh, that's really ugly. I've been that many a day. I've um, believed very horrible things and had very horrible perceptions of women and other people mm -hmm. and just and were just as totally was, um, oblivious to the suffering of other beings mm -hmm. in the society based off of my own conditioning. Mm -hmm. And when I had when I was when I was of the awareness to address it, it was still a challenge for me to fully integrate that. So making sure we're doing that like um, Chris was saying earlier, in a very supportive way where somebody can have that discussion and go to that sensitive place of yeah, yeah, okay, I have these issues, and, and we met with that. Because, you know, I, and I'm really working on that also. That's why when somebody comes to me in a way I find it's very uncomfortable, I don't just flip out, curse them out, spit in their face. Things that reactionarily, through my, my trauma and conditioning and my PTSD, through all my life experiences, I think about doing. Not to say I do it, it'd be that energy there. But I say, okay, how do I best um, communicate, make this person ally? How do I speak to them? And, try, and we all and we all we all gonna come up short with it, but we do the best we can. But I think it's important that we acknowledge and we make that effort to see it, that acknowledging that person's existence, not how um, they can be a part of this movement. Because it's all about life. It's really about life in general and having your respect for life. But a lot of people don't understand that they haven't made that correlation. They, they don't have respect for their own life, and that's not necessarily of their own fault. It's just the way just the way things are currently. If I can just interject briefly, this imposed ignorance that you're talking about, this kind of systemic institutional mm -hmm. cultural problem, it's the primary reason we're targeting Chipotle. Because yeah. if there's no if there's no company in the country that is doing this more than Chipotle, mm -hmm. the, the the propaganda, the humane washing they put out. I mean, they're they're manipulating people, good people who actually want to do good for animals, into doing incredibly violent, horrible things to animals. And you know, we we had national press coverage in Salon just a week and a half ago. Um, we had something published in Randy Shaw's journal locally. We're starting to get some attention behind this issue. But I think 
There's so much sympathy for animals, human and non-human, in this country that can be realized and agitated, but multinational corporations that have billions of dollars mm -hmm. to lose are trying to divert that sort of sympathy into, into cheap consumerism. Mm -hmm. And um, so if you haven't heard about our campaign, please do read about it. There's a lot of good material on our website. But that's what, you, what, what, what Ortega was talking about is exactly what Chipotle is reinforcing, exactly what we're trying to defeat with this campaign. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ortega. Um, Jean and Nina. Oh, I was thinking of something, but I didn't raise my hand. But oh, you didn't? Okay. That's okay. Well, this may be stating the obvious and completely... Well, anyway. There's also the notion of, of distancing the ident sense of or politics of identity, and you identify yourself by what you're not. And yeah. so, it's, in some cases, it's not just the Chinese do this. I've, I've, I've seen, um, wait, that's not the way I want to introduce it, but um, just the other day I was reminded of this, again, on Facebook with these ignorant comments, but, you know, there there's scenes from from um, slaughterhouses or somebody beating a pig or something, and there are these comments that say, they should boil in hell, they should be, you know, beaten just the way they were, and there doesn't seem to be any acknowledgement that most of the workers are victims, too. I mean, mm -hmm. they become sadists, they, they beat up cows, I mean, it's horrifying, but but it's they're, dis they're dismissed in the same language, except that there, there isn't also the convenience of saying, I can distance myself from this, this behavior by also saying, well, they're Indian or, or they're Chinese. I, I can say it simply by their actions. And so you're left thinking, well, what do they think? It's better to... Slash their throats without punching them first, and um, but it, it's it's it reminded me of that pushing it away and saying, well, I'm not that way, so I'm going to use all this violent language mm -hmm. to show just how not that way I am. Mm -hmm. and if, yeah, and if you just happen to have you know some other added thing that you can Attribute. label on that that person doing that, and it's strangely a lot of them don't seem to a lot of them well, people who write these comments don't seem to acknowledge that. Most of the workers are, in fact, very oppressed immigrants, often, um, often uh, uh, illegal, without any protection, no law, you know, blah blah blah. But there's still that those hateful comments that are that are exactly the same, and it's that you know, don't don't include me in that practice. I'll show you how against mm -hmm. it I am by saying they should be killed too. Mia mm -hmm. well, yeah, and then Esther. Um, I'm really glad that DXC is starting like a group of um, people, activists of color, mm -hmm. because there is an action that I've been wanting to organize for a while, because it would be so <coughs> prominent and we would get a lot of media attention. However, um, I never brought it up because the place that I want to um, protest against um, it there is someone um, of color who runs the place. So as an activist, um, you know, of a quote unquote minority, it's very problematic for me to protest them. Mm -hmm. To say like, stand up for the animals, but at the same time, like, I don't want to villainize you. Mm -hmm. Do you want to share the place? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would like to discuss it when we have the group set up. Okay, sure. All right, so that's Let's definitely great. do that. So what Mina's doing is like making us very curious, which is good strategically. Um, Esther? No. And I, I looked up several articles, and these people that I've seen pictures of where they're doing the, um, the cruel thing to animals, things that a lot of times, some of them, may even have mental health issues themselves and we have to respect that, that they're all forced into situations and have been in fact been taken advantage of by the mm -hmm. powers to right. be because right. they're disabled because if they have a mental health issue or a learning mm -hmm. issue i've been taken advantage mm -hmm. of in fact in a couple of times i was physically assaulted because of my speech impediment. I was kicked out of, um, I was not chosen to play kickball and stuff. Yeah. I spent, and so the, they're, they're also victimized. And 
in some sense, in some ways, they were punished in that same way. And you're going to tend to meet out. You're punished in, and I, myself, you have to make a conscious choice to be the exact opposite. You know, I make choices to be the exact opposite. Um, and a lot of people repeat these patterns of how they were dealt with when they were children and they did something wrong. And they're punishing the animal in the same way as a ch child. I see them as a victim, but yet yeah, I can say, hey, let's take, there is some credibility here, kid, you know. But, I mean, there is a system that perpetuates mm -hmm. um, that, that they're, they don't have that other resource to where they can take that. Hey, I was in, at my work, I finish these cows and stuff. When I go home, yet I go home and I have these bad dreams about it. Mm -hmm. So you got to try to see the human side and the victimization side. That doesn't mean that they can't take a, you know, mm -hmm. accountability and say, yes, what I would do, I, my job is cruel and horrible and all, all that. And that's why I have these bad dreams, you know, and, they can, and they're not, and they're so poorly paid, they can't even afford to go talk to us. Thanks, Esther, for sharing your experience. It's really touching. And also, it reminds me of something that I heard. What people do to society, or what, what society does to children, <coughs> children do to society. Just mm -hmm. showing that, like, you know, what you see is what you do. So, thank you. Jude? I just want to say, I see this, this guy is really getting somewhere because we're opening up a lot of issues. I really enjoy hearing the last few speeches, especially because they're really going like, all the way in the versions, so they all do were good versions. And um, what I really wanted to say is, I think that the issue of mental health, like I see people as all on the spectrum, mm -hmm. there's only in the corners of the spectrum, so it's not really specific to people with mental illness mm -hmm. to um, Get on that violence is in general, right? It's in all of us, mm -hmm. which is to say it's very important for us not to be acting like angels of pure light, right? Yes. That's yes. very important. Someone yeah. different from us as an angel of pure light, mm -hmm. right? And that's just not true. Nobody's angel of pure light, right? So mm -hmm. I think it's very important for us as activists to be really keeping a um, self-respective, right? Yes. To be self-respective of what we are doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because if it's centered around you, mm -hmm. then that's not compassion. Yeah. Compassion is centered on the other party. Yes. Yeah. Right? Thanks, Jude. That actually, I know Ortega's getting excited over there. That actually, <laughs> <laughs> that actually really relates to what you said earlier and it yeah. resonated with me. Because, you know, honestly, like, I have said things that are, you know, violent towards, um, Towards animal abusers because it makes me makes me yeah. well you 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 were pointing that out oh <laughs> no I'm not pointing at you but I don't need my bunny no <laughs> um, sorry so yeah I, I think you know we all make mistakes yeah. even like sure. say things that are wrong because we live in a society which is speciesist mm -hmm. um, and which is racist and it's really hard to combat that without people who are going to be honest and you know let us know in a compassionate way that um, we can be better. So yeah, um, it's good to be, keep ourselves in balance. And we don't just live in it, we, we, we developed in it from utero. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Brian and then Kelly and then Chris and Josh. Oh yeah, no, I think we've already talked about this a little bit, but what Ortega and Drew both said. Um, one, sorry, what? Go ahead. Okay. Um, one, talking about kind of like, just the imposition of some like, foreign values, like a bunch of white people saying, oh, well, like, you know, go vegan, go shop at Whole Foods, yeah, right? Yeah. And and two, like, the idea of it being about ourselves mm -hmm. and not about animals, I mm -hmm. think, like, like, I came to this movement from, like, a very wealthy white household, and, like, it's, it's hard, it's easy to, like, fall into that idea, because that's what a lot of the movement is right now, is this kind of selfish, very white-centric veganism. It's all about me. Mm -hmm. It's about what I eat, you know, mm -hmm. it's about where mm -hmm. I shop, mm -hmm. and, and like... <laughs> and about how you're different from all these people who are right, not. Right, you're not. Yeah, yeah different, 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 better, 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 better,
Um, and it was almost like coming to Direct Action Ever, who has a different outlook on this, which is like, oh, it's not actually about where you shop, because like, it's kind of stupid. <laughs> um, it's actually about like the animals that are suffering, and like, you know, you, like trying to shift away from this whole like, personal diet thing, I think is, is like just integral to this movement, um, and like kind of progressing forward. Um, and it's and it's hard coming from a place of extreme privilege, mm -hmm. and many for many of the people in the movement to even see outside of that selfish right. perspective. Right. Um, even I mean, if you try, it's still so hard. To yeah, because I thought you know originally like when I read some of these things like boycott veganism was something that Wayne wrote, um, and you know initially I was like ah oh, I don't believe this. <laughs> But, you know, I think it doesn't necessarily mean what you think it means. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's a subtext. Pro provocative yeah. title. Yeah. Um, yeah. But like, I think these conversations are like really great, and like, this is these are the exact kind of conversations we have to have to like change the structure of our movement from mm -hmm. like selfish human consumerism to like talking about animals who are actually suffering. I appreciate you you, you uh, like to chime in also with that perspective, and you know contributing in that way. Yeah. You know, because I mean, here we are. We are talking about you know this issue of people of color, mm -hmm. and then we talk about speciesism, but you know, yeah. I, didn't want to, I I started to have like this kind of feeling that it, it seemed kind of marginalized, like people who didn't identify as people of color, mm -hmm. or people who didn't yeah. come from a particular background, so for you to speak up kind of, you know, I can feel more kinship with you as an ally, yeah. because I kind of know where you stand, and it's like, you know, it's all out here, you know, everybody, you know, get it in, it's, like, it's still no mm -hmm. so, so, so I appreciate you, you know, step it up and, Way. Yeah. I guess back to what you and Wayne were saying about the bubble that has the perception of that bubble or whatever that you know I mean if you're not you know if you're not in it if you're you know if you're outside of it or whatever it's just like okay oh here's that info oh wow man this man this vegan is man that sounds great man you know hurting animals man that's bad but you know but yeah once again just you know just you know, going to you know, man, going to Whole Foods on on a budget is just like yeah, it's <laughs> <laughs> it's um, it is that. But I, I do like that you do that, that you did touch upon the bubble, and then like if if you're not if you're not in it, or if you I mean if you don't know, it's like an unawareness of your unawareness, mm -hmm. and it's um, it's so it's I don't know, I, it's probably not that. It's just getting getting the word out, you know. So I mean, people that aren't aware that there is this group or whatever. And I mean, if you took a picture right now, I mean, look at us mm -hmm. in here. I mean, Very that's. Nice mm. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's. I mean, there it is. I mean, there's your start right there, and getting, you know, just and then just going to. I don't know, just uh, communities or whatever, or, you know, farmers markets, whatever, just, I mean, letting people know that this info is out there, and that this is going on. Mm -hmm. Hey, Tracy, Kelly. Um, Darren, one of our activists in Vancouver, just has a comment to make. He says, one of the interesting observations I had here in Vancouver on how a predominantly white animal rights organization can combat racism when diversifying the activist community is not viable in the short term is to diversify our campaigns. For example, the Vancouver Animal Defense League, a mostly white local group that practices direct action, ran a shark fin campaign targeting a Chinese restaurant for around 10 months in a mostly white middle class neighborhood. The experiences of protesting there were typically positive. Protesters are met with lots of community support and low police presence. In past months, VADL, the same organization, began working on a new fur campaign in a wealthier neighborhood this time targeting a white-owned denim store selling fur trim jackets. Demonstrations there are typically much more tense with greater hostility between activists and local residents, mm -hmm. and also much more police presence and intimidation. By diversifying campaigns in this way, animal activists actually reveal the underlying racism within the city and allow people to call out these racist double standards. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, that's awesome. Thank you, Darren. That's good. Yeah, thanks, Darren. That was, that was amazing. Thank mm -hmm. you. Kelly for sharing that. Um, I lost track, but I think Josh, you had your hand up. Okay, Chris and then Ronnie. So, um, one thing I've found really helpful is to, I mean, I guess, in general, we definitely think that, you know, humans should not be abusing and eating animals or their products, um, but 
the more, more important thing is that I think we tend to try to address justice and social justice. And so, for instance, like I had a friend from Occupy uh, San Jose, and and I was telling him he should come over and he should hang out with us, that he would, you know, like us and that we would like him. And that, um, and he was like, you know, I'm not really a vegan. He said, I'm not a vegan or whatever. I said, you know, I know that you believe oppression is always wrong and that you want to fight for justice for everyone because I've known him for a little while and some of the projects, other projects we worked on. And so we started coming in and hanging out. And so, and I think he, uh, I'm pretty sure he became vegan eventually, but like, you know, I guess my point is, is you know, a lot of us we talk, talk about um, talking to our families or talking to um, other social justice groups or um, I think Adrian, you were talking about or, 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 like your you know, very <laughs> I it's like with my family, um, like with, you know, my Mexican side of the family, they have a lot of history with the farm workers movement. And like I've told them for years about veganism and no one's ever really been interested other than to tell me that I'm not getting enough protein. <laughs> like, but so since you know I, since I, we've started direct action everywhere and I started talking to them about justice and about the injustice of what's going on and that you know the oppression, like you know, I have like my eighty something year old aunt call me like a few weeks ago telling me, you know, she actually knows the day of our next <laughs> I think like half of our own activists don't know that, like, um, you know, and so like, you know, just, I think that um, talking about it as an issue of justice and not as an issue of mm -hmm. what we shop, how, wh how we eat, or talking about, you know, us, it's just talking about the animals, talking about, you know, the fact that, you know, this is discrimination, this is violence, and that those are the messages that are important. And, um, and these are messages that I think pretty much every community can really relate to. And, you know, I, and but it's also really important to be authentic. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you go to another community and you say, you know, I oppose discrimination, then you should really oppose discrimination, like including uh, the discrimination that, you know, whoever else is facing. Like, I don't mm -hmm. go to other communities and tell them, hey, you should be working with us, like, I'll go and work with someone else, and if something comes up, I'll tell them, you know, but, uh, like, mostly I'd, I've done, like, I guess some immigration stuff and, uh, you know, other, other stuff like that, but, like, I don't go there, like, talking about animal rights, and I don't mm -hmm. go there talking about uh, veganism, certainly, but, you know, afterwards when they after the march and they want to go get something to eat, then I'll like tell them about it. Like when you start talking about mm -hmm. things that they want to do, or if it comes up otherwise. But um, I think it's just important to always be authentic and never try to go. Mm -hmm. uh, not that people here were necessarily, <coughs> talking about, but um, people were talking about how to address address veganism, and I don't I don't necessarily think we need to address veganism. Just address justice, mm -hmm. to address uh, discrimination and violence. Mm. Thanks, Chris. Um, that actually reminds me of a suggestion Lucia made, and I think it's really important and ties in is that you know, we need to have more non vegans and, and animal eaters at these open meetings because that does mean that we're you know, reaching out to people who are not just within our own community mm -hmm. and yeah, preaching right. to the choir, so to speak. Um, Josh, Ronnie, and then Ashley. Real quick, um, a few of you guys touched on this idea of like, oh, we make mistakes and we're not perfect, and um, that's so true. <laughs> but, um, I think that it's, I think that that's in terms of kind of any activist pursuit. I think that that's mm -hmm. one of the most important balancing acts that the movement can do, because on the one hand, we we have we have to inject a kind of humanity into the activism that we're doing in order to stay authentic. But on the other hand. Um, uh, not to be like super inflammatory with the rhetoric, but um, <laughs> go <ahead>. we, <laughs> um, we like as as animal liberationists, um, the movement is counter to billions and billions and billions of dollars and um, well well entrenched industry, and it's it's not 
it, we're not much short of being at war. And so if, um, if, if, we, if we flaunt these kinds of mistakes, then we will be discredited, we will be, it, it, it just, mm -hmm. you see this with mm -hmm. a, a movement after movement after movement, people who are against the movement will use any means yeah. possible to dismantle it, and so it's, it's important to find the kind of sweet spot center, you know, the tactical. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. Um, well, yeah. Um, Ashley, and then next. Oh, yeah, that just was, um, you know, I just, just wanted to comment on uh, the sort of the conversation. It, it, might, it might be like a, it's not necessarily a false that kind of thing, but I, I guess there is like a, in terms of like people, you could buy your way out of this sort of conversation. Um, Versus like focusing on justice or focus on, I think even within that, I think that can be an inclusivity. I think there's a large amount of people who I talk to who are, are vegan or became vegan based on various different ways. Mm -hmm. conversation. So it's, I don't want to shoot something funny, but like yo, like because as activists, I'm like, oh, don't do the boycott, the, you know, and that type of thing. And it's sort of just like saying step back and really be like, you really got to look at what's right in front of you. And really address that. Like for different people require different things in interaction. You got to shape mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So some people will say, yeah, like yeah, it's it's a good thing. <laughs> Ultimately, if people are, are not, you know, from the perspective of what we're talking about, are not buying um, certain products, right? So it's just, I just wanted to bring that up. And then also, um, we wanted to say too. Also, I'm I'm, I'm a, I have this organization called SOS Choose. I work with Alliance for Climate Education at SOS Choose. Also, Earth Amplified. But, Green hip hop media, stuff like that. That's what juice we do. Also, yeah, tap, tap, tap. Yeah, tap is work with us. We have a solar power. Um, actually, solar's up now at Jack on the Square. We do solar power juicing smoothies. Cool. Um, you know, we're going to go more into like sort of raw eating foods as well. And um, yeah, you know, we have these monthly events. We work with Cartega on different stuff too. Like, um, but definitely, that there's a space for that. So it's mm -hmm. an invitation. We do it at United Roots Media Center in 28th and 28th in Telegraph. Mm -hmm. And we opened it up and like five years ago, where I am. Go to people. It used to be a like, <coughs> shelter. So just like, that's a whole other conversation. We work, there's a lot of uh, black men determination groups there. Um, just so there's a lot of different avenues. And I think that the, the skill is like just being like shape shifty and like having like, being able to just like cross communicate and really get really quickly in situations and able to communicate as much as possible. I would love to have this. I want to know, like, I want to learn Spanish. I want to, like, make languages as possible because I'm really about this liberation, you know what I'm saying? So sometimes you got to do what you got to do and, like, schedule that, you know what I'm saying? So if you want to actually create that group, I'm down to create a group, like, animal liberation is to learn Spanish, right? <laughs> Seriously, just because it's like, necessary, you got you to, you you like, be viable and really do what you got to do to, like, um, to get the, to, to the goal, you know what I'm saying? You know? Thanks, Ashel. Um, Esther, and then hopefully we can take some last comments and move on to discuss Maybe we should invite people who haven't gotten a chance to speak course, after yeah. just, just yeah. to give some space to some of you as well. I really enjoyed that conversation. Um, I've not reached the point where I'm um, practicing veganism and stuff, but that doesn't mean I agree with the different practices, the horrible practices that are happening to animals. You know, and even us being the most guilty of it. I mean, there were times, you know, I mean, as a child, I mean, until you learn that certain, you do certain things for animals, cool. Yeah, I was just guilty of it. Um, but I don't think, I'm in any encouraging and stuff. I think, like, out in the valley where I live, I'm sure there are animal rights. Activists. Maybe they just haven't spoken out because they're very pro cattle raising out there, you know, they didn't stop down, you know, they didn't look back. I kind of like to, you know, and in reference to getting more people who have more members of the disabled communities to come and join animal rights. Because there might be some animal rights activists doing that. Great. Yeah. You know, to be more inclusive, and one of the ways is I would like to do it, you know, maybe like, not necessarily like a protest, but you know, like 
with educational pro uh, um, mm -hmm. educational outreach where like posters and stuff of you know not horrendously good things, but just men a great mention of with Kentucky Fry that these practices are that you know young Burton and and I'm all less guilty of that, you know. Type of thing like different restaurants like KLC out in the valley and try to you know, raise the consciousness of the farming and maybe rather than get them, rather than to raise cattle and stuff, to raise soybeans to feed people and stuff like that. You know, just even if they just do it acre by acre. Mm -hmm. We're in the valley, we're in the valley, you know? Which valley? Tri Valley, um, Pleasanton, mm -hmm. Livermore, Double. Oh, okay, 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 got it. <laughs> Half an hour, Easter here. Yeah. Thanks, Esther. And, um, Can I just say, Esther, I, as someone who's participated in a number of events and has come to our protest, to the extent veganism matters, I consider you a huge ally to veganism and the animals, so much bigger than some of the shops at Wolf Foods. So I don't think you should feel bashful or ashamed at all about that at all. I think you've been such a wonderful contributor, and the stories you've shared today, I think, have inspired a lot of people mm -hmm. and given a lot of education to people who haven't understood the intersection between ableism and yeah. speciesism, too, which I think is an important mm -hmm. intersection. And the final thing is, to the extent that you want help in reaching out to the, to the disabled community or the differently abled community, direct action everywhere is all about empowering activists in their own community. So whatever we can do to help, we want to help you. You are exactly the sort of person we want to reach out to and make stronger and, and, and give you the resources you need to do what you want to do and what you're passionate about. So thank you for sharing. Thank you so much, Esther. Um, and before we move on to discussing our organizing I really highly encourage anybody who has not spoken today to speak out and share your experiences. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you want to be funny? I have nothing to say. Okay. Okay, well, to say we love you then, okay? <laughs> I love you then. We'll, we'll take a break before we move on to the next part of the meeting. Yeah. If you need to leave, that's totally fine. I know the meeting's already been very long. Lucia? Oh. I just want to say I really, really appreciate the forum and the topic at hand, which is really yes. so crucial for us. Hey guys, guys, let's listen to Lucia. Uh, but I wanted to also say, kind of say what Chris was saying about reaching out to the community and working in an environment, uh, working in a, a low-income community, and also with students and students with disabilities, I really appreciate that the opportunity is there but reaching out to the community in, in the sense that we're trying to approach it is then going to be very difficult for me because, and I find this to be quite to be the biggest obstacle, is religion. The religion of the communities that I'm trying to reach yeah. is always an obstacle. So whenever I try to table a discussion or the discussion I have about social justice, religion always happens to be one of the biggest hurdles that I have. Because the Bible says it's okay, so it really leaves not very much little room to, for discussion in terms of the justice and the oppression that we're seeing in the animals. So I like the idea of really approaching this not so much from a food choice, but from a social justice issue, which is really near and dear to the communities that we work with and that I particularly work with. So I appreciate that. This has really been covered on different angles and all different aspects. I mean, even the Bible is a story about rising up against injustice. Exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. So, exactly. The people who are Christians should be able to appreciate the story. Yeah. I think there's organizations too. There's organizations cropping up. I think I've seen around this that um, that deal with the same conversation we're having from religious standpoints. So, yeah. Yeah. We can talk about. It. I think it's just a messaging and framework. You know? yeah. I, would, I would like to be a part of that community. There's a committee that is actually creating like a bunch of different messaging. Billboards, flyering, I think that's like the art code is really the you know, the potent thing, like the outfacing to the community and what people are actually interfacing depending on that community. I think I, I would love to be a part of that team, whoever that's whatever whoever's creating that. Or media, shorts, videos. Thanks, Ashley. Um, yeah, should, we should talk about this. Okay. Kelly, um, if the wealthy privileged white kid can say something. <laughs> Um, I never thought about racism or any kind of discrimination nearly as much as I have since becoming a part of DXC. And part of it might be because, like, I just didn't even think about racism as a kid because I grew up, uh, until I was eight years old, I was in this extremely diverse community in Toronto. And, like, I, I have to look back on photos to realize, like, 
there was no such thing as minority, and like there there weren't even like the kids to kind of separate into racial groups the way kids in American schools seem to at my school. So like wasn't something that I started thinking about until like year, and even then I just kind of ignored the problem. But since sections of everything, I've like started noticing, you know, that in really minor ways, every now and then I'll say something that is racially problematic or that perpetuates misogyny and patriarchy. Mm -hmm. And I like that we have or or ableism or heteronormativity, any mm -hmm. other kinds of discriminations that we don't realize we're perpetuating that we're like, you know, so full heartedly against the like because you know the, there are these forces acting us that make us behave in certain ways. We don't notice that we're perpetuating these things. Um, and I just I want to say that I really love that we have this community where we can call each other out on these things in like a positive way, mm -hmm. you know, and not in a like, you know, you're a bad person for saying that, um, inclu including species of things like, you know, saying eating meat instead of eating animals. So a lot of us are now like trying to encourage each other to say things like eating animals instead. And to reprogram ourselves exactly, and like little things in our language. I just really love that we have a community where we can like help each other to grow and to improve our language so that it's less oppressive and, and to improve our thinking, like even in the most minor ways, so that we're all just being more inclusive with each other. And that's just like vital to this movement, to any movement, to end oppression and injustice. So I just, I love you guys. Oh, I love you. <laughs> okay, um, so I think you are feeling a little restless. Should we take like a 10 minute break and yeah, come back? Cool. All right, so let's come back at uh, um, 420. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, do we want to? Do we want to? Are people okay if we do a quick group photo? Because we're we're starting to take group oh, cool. photos of all the events. So we're we're right in front of the TV, underneath the big banner.